الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Today we are uh, really continuing the discussion we had last week about Surah Al-Teen and going right into Surah Al-Alaq and the two have a very deep relationship with each other these two surahs Last week we talked about the two essential components within the human being, the, uh, the animal side of the human being and the soul that Allah Azza wa Jal blessed the human being with and the higher purpose that Allah Azza wa Jal gave the human being. In that surah, Allah actually uh, honored and aggrandized and actually highlighted the higher purpose of the human being with the words, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ But in this surah we'll see the other side. What happens when the human being really, it's almost a lot of this surah is a tafsir of the ayah uh, where we read, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ We'll see the flip side of that human being in this surah from the ayat, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرَّآهُ استغنى. And the, the ayat will go on talking about the rebellion of the human being and how he thinks he doesn't need anyone else, he's free in and of himself. So we'll see that the relationship between those two inshaAllah ta'ala. There, let's start just making a small list of uh, interesting parallels between Surah Al-Teen and Surah Al-Alaq and then we'll move forward. In the previous surah once again, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ We talked about how that's alluding to the ruh. That there's the animal, the body of the human being, which is a remarkable creation, but really what gave it, what gave the human being honor is the ruh that Allah blew into it. And when Allah blew the ruh into the human being's body, then He commanded the angels, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مَنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Right? First he fashioned him, سَوَّيْتُهُ Then نَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مَنْ رُوحِ Then I blew into him of, my, of the ruh that I created. Then fall into sajda. So the honor was really the ruh that Allah had put inside the human being. In this surah Allah says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ So here, there, خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Here, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ And عَلَقَ is really a clot of blood. More literally, it means something, a, a, a piece of a uh, wet fluid, sticky fluid that sticks to something and hangs off of something. Like muallaqa, that which is hanging off. Okay? And that term is actually even used in, uh, in the context of marriage where you're, you know, you, you're married to her, you're married to your wife, but you're not really taking care of her at all, so she's left hanging. She's stuck to you, but she's not really associated with you. So, فَذَرُوهَا muallaqa That you're leaving her like she's basically clinging, but not really associated with you much anymore. Anyhow, there's an interesting transition from the first person to the third person. There Allah said, خَلَقْنَا insan. We created the human being. Here He says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ خَلَقَ The third person, He created the human being. So there's a difference between we created and He created. And the difference is, from a rhetorical point of view, the first person is close. And the third person is far. When you say we, the person's here. When you say he, he's not here, he's far away. This is actually Allah distancing Himself from this human being. And as we go further, we will see why. First of all, the lowly dimension of the human being. His humble beginnings have been highlighted. So Allah is distancing Himself. He brings Himself when you live up to the standards He created you for, the high expectations He has of you. في أحسن تقويم He brought Himself closer. But now, especially if you look at the, the tone of this surah, most of the surah is very negative, except for the little bit of the beginning. Most of the surah is very, very negative and the, the attitude of the rebellious. So Allah Azza wa Jal takes a more stern uh, person, the third person, in regards to that. In the beginning here, Allah Azza wa Jal says, اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ akram." Very famous ayat, right? Recite and your Lord is the most gracious, the most noble. So here He highlights His nobility. In the previous surah, He highlighted the nobility of the, of the greatest prophets, the Ulul Azm. وَالتِّينَ وَالزَّيْتُونَ وَطُورِ سِنِينَ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ It was alluding to the nobility of the, pre- the greatest prophets. And here Allah Himself, his, He's the most noble. So it's not just Kareem, وَرَبُّكَ Kareem, which occurs in other places in the Qur'an is وَرَبُّكَ akram, The most noble, the most noble of all. Then here Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us, He created the human being in the best possible fashion, and then He gives us some clue as to what made us so honorable. What made us so noble? Like in a hadith we find that is narrated under the definition of aql by Imam Raghib al-Asfahani. He cites, he cites a couple of a hadith. And one of the very interesting hadith under that is, مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ خَلْقًا أَكْرَمَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْعَقْلِ Allah did not create any creation more noble than the intellect. 
Meaning what, one of the things that makes the human being so noble is that Allah gifted him with this remarkable intellect. And Allah highlights the use of that intellect in this surah. He says, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ بِالْقَلَمْ right? And then he says, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ So he taught the human being with the pen, he taught him what he didn't know. And being taught and you learning yourself and being involved with the pen, these are all things, these are activities of the intellect. So on the, in the previous surah, you're created in the best possible fashion. And in this surah, what makes you the best? One of the things that make you the best is your ability to learn. Is your ability to learn, subhanAllah. Then, in the previous surah, like I mentioned earlier on, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ We reduced him to the lowest of the possible low. We rejected him, therefore he became the lowest of the low. But in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, what, how did he get there? How did he get to be the lowest of the low? There it was just mentioned, but now we get to the how. كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْنَى إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجْعَى This is the end, the psyche of the person who, re- who became lowest of the low. Why he rebels? What, what is Tuhiyan anyway? And what is this general attitude of the human being? We'll talk about that. So it's really an explanation of that, the, the statement in the previous surah. Then towards the end of the previous surah, we found this very strong rhetorical question by Allah. فَمَا يُكَذِّبُكَ بَعْدُ الدِّينِ what, what kind of person would lie against you? After all of these evidences in regards to the religion, what kind of wretched person must it be that would lie against you? And half of this surah almost is dedicated to exactly that kind of wretched person, to Abu Jahl. So that was the general question. What kind of person could that be that would lie against the religion? And here we're going to see, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَى Those ayat are pretty much unanimously understood to be referring to Abu Jahl. So first the question was raised, what kind of person would that be? And now this surah will answer, that's the kind of person. So we'll do a little bit of a psychological analysis of Abu Jahl, and what led him to be the kind of vic- the wicked enemy of Islam that he was. Then finally, uh, just a couple more actually, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ And that was the last discussion we had last week, about the word hakim and ahkam, how they mean two things, they can be rooted in two things. One, it has to do with wisdom, and the other has to do with being a judge and having the power to make pass judgments over someone. Both, both of those become relevant in this surah. On the one hand, Allah passes, you know how a judge, when, he, when the guilty party, the case is made, and they're found guilty, then the judge orders a punishment. So in this surah, as a judge, Allah orders a punishment. Right? That's one, on the one hand, this is the judgment of Allah. And we'll talk, I'll talk, tell you about the meanings of that being grabbed by the forehead, he's going to be dragged, and then you're being told, this is what made you guilty. It's, why are you being dragged by your forehead? It's your, you know, this forelock, this front part of your hair. You know, this is the punishment des- uh, described. We'll talk about why Allah Azza wa uses that precise language when He passes that judgment. The other meaning of ahkam and hakimin was wisdom. The owner of all wisdom, the wisest of all the, wi- the wise. And it's only becoming that Allah Azza wa reveals some of that wisdom and a sample of that wisdom to the human being, which is the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a manifestation of Allah's wisdom. So in the very beginning of this surah, is a manifestation of Allah's wisdom. He commands the human being, beginning with the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ Recite, read. Read what? By ijma' again, read Qur'an. Read the hikmah, the wisdom that Allah has sent to you, which is the, the book of Allah itself, subhanAllah. Then another very interesting rhetorical parallel in the previous surah, we saw the mention of iman and amilu salihat, right? We saw illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihat, falahum ajrun ghayru mamnun. So that was there was a natural sequence between iman and amilu salihat. But there's actually a reverse sequence too. You know, of course, iman comes first. When you have iman, you do good deeds. But when you do good deeds, guess what happens? Your iman increases. So it's yes, iman comes first, actions come second. But good deeds in and of themselves also end up increasing your iman. The stronger your iman, the better your deeds get. So it's this cycle, right? It's this cycle. Now, the, the first part of that cycle was in the previous surah. And that was, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَأَعْمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ In this surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَسْجُدْ The ayah we made sajda on. وَسْجُدْ وَاقْتَرِبْ Make sajda, which is a good deed. It's an action, it's a deed. But وَاقْتَرِبْ Become closer. Getting closer to Allah is not a deed. What is that? It's, it's a state of iman. It's a state of iman. So really the state of iman is mentioned second, and the action is mentioned first. Converse of the previous, the, the opposite sequence in the previous surah, iman first, 
and uh, uh, deeds second. The other, just generally you've already probably noticed, the previous surah mentioned things in general, and this surah is giving specific examples. It's getting specific. Previous surah alluded to the messengers generally, وَالتِّينِ وَالزَّيْتُونَ وَطُورِ سِنِينَ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ Generally, specifically in this surah, which messenger? Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very specific to him. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ It starts with that. Generally in the previous surah, the human being was created in the best possible fashion. Here more specific, what makes him the best possible creation? Generally in the previous surah, we reduced him to the lowest of the low. Here, what led him specifically to be the lowest of the low? Generally in the previous surah, what kind of person would reject you? What kind of person would be a kafir against you, lie against you in regards to the deen? And in this surah specifically, Abu Jahl. So it's going from general to specific. Min al-am ila al-khas. That's what's happening in this uh, profound surah. Here, inshallah ta'ala, in, the, in the, the first introductory comments of the surah in and of itself, beyond the comparison between itself and the previous surah, we have to make a couple of uh, important comments. And one of them is that this messenger sallallahu alayhi wa came after what you could really, in our own way, you could call a long, dark age. The last messenger that had come before him was Isa alayhi salam. And between him and the coming of, uh, and the declaration of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu as a messenger, which is in the Christian year count, it's 610, that's when he declared to be a messenger, it's about a 500 some year gap, almost 600 years of a gap, in which there has been no messengers. Human, humanity has been in complete darkness. Humanity has been in complete darkness. And now finally there's light. Now finally the sun has risen again. And this is the ultimate revelation that is about to be revealed. So this, the surah we're about to read, the reason I bring this up is because of most mufassirun, they say this is the first surah and the first five ayat are the first revelation of all revelations to have been revealed. Even though that's not entirely unanimous. There are some mufassirun who say Surah Al-Muddathir was the first revelation. Others who say Surah Al-Fatiha was the first revelation. But there's a way to reconcile all of those and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on inshallah. But generally, most mufassirun you will find agreeing that the ayat that we're reading today, the first five ayat at least, five, six ayat, those are the original first revelation given to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In regards to that, the question arises, how did revelation begin? How did this process begin for the Messenger himself? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a very long narration in a sahihain it's muttafaqun alayh, narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, in which he was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, you know, how was it? How did revelation begin? How did it start coming to you, Ya Rasulullah? So he responded, uh, and, and she's paraphrasing really, and she says, in أَوَّلَ مَا بُدِئَ بِهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنَ الْوَحِي الرُّؤْيَا الصَّادِقَ فِي النَّوْمِ فَكَانَ لَا يَرَى رُؤْيَا إِلَّا جَاءَتْ مِثْلَ فَلْقِ الصُّبْحِ what, what that means is, he would start seeing true dreams early on. The Messenger والسلام, would start seeing things, and then the next day or the next week or a couple of days later, those would come true. As true as the rising of the morning. That's the expression in Arabic, meaning it's exactly as he saw it. As sure as it is that the sun rose that morning, as sure as it was that his dream that he had seen a few days ago came true. And this is now the beginning, it's, it's almost like the Messenger والسلام, is being oriented for revelation. This is before the angel and before the event in the cave and all of that. This is earlier on. And then, ثُمَّ حَبَّبَ حُبِّبَ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَاءِ Then solitude became beloved to him. He didn't like being among people anymore. He wasn't much conversation. He liked being by himself and being in solitude and, and reflecting. فَكَانَ يَخْلُو بِغَارِ حِرَاء Then he used to be alone by himself in the cave of Hira. يَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ اللَّيَالِ ذَوَاتِ الْعَدَدِ He used to spend many many nights in it. يَتَحَنَّثُ is an interesting word. تَحَنَّثَ in Arabic means to ward sins off of yourself, to wash it off of yourself. So it's an interesting choice of word for Rasulullah wasallam. It's like he wanted to wash off the influences of the evil society. He wanted to not think about all of those things, remove them from himself when he was by himself thinking. Now a lot of, uh, especially writers of seerah, have, have kind of grappled with the issue of what was he thinking about? What is it that the Messenger والسلام, was reflecting upon? And there are a number of answers. And some of them have to do with the general questions, who created me? What is the purpose of my life, etc., etc., the larger questions of life. And essentially the questions that all human beings should seek the answers of. That's one line of reasoning that some 
historians and writers of seerah have presented. But others have presented a very interesting addition to that that I'd like to share with you. The Messenger ﷺ, before revelation came, he was already a humanitarian. He was what you could call a human rights activist. Okay, even before revelation was given to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you know when he, you know, you guys know the story. You've heard it many times. When he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was given revelation, he was terrified when he was commanded to read. He came down. He came to uh, Khadija radhiyallahu taala anha. He said, "I'm scared for my life. I fear for my life." And she said, "No, you have nothing to be worried about." And then she gave a whole speech of why you have nothing to be worried about. You're so charitable. You take care of those who are oppressed. You take care of the needy. You look after the orphan. She gave all these humanitarian reasons for why. Why would you be in any trouble? Allah Azza wa Jalla will take care of you, right? So this idea of him being concerned with the needs of humanity was, or he was very deeply concerned with the needs of humanity. But to help you understand the point that the historians make, I'll give you a parallel. In our times, you have charity organizations, right? There are organizations that are trying to feed the hungry, help the homeless, things like that. And all of these organizations, at the end of the year, they have something you could call a progress report, right? Last year we fed a hundred people, but this year we fed five hundred people. Last year we helped a thousand kids. This year we helped five thousand kids. Whatever it may be, so they have to show that they made progress. Right? It's better than it was last year. But compare that to how many people, how many more people needed food, or how many more children needed help. They're helping more children. But hunger, it's there, so they're helping the hungry. But hunger itself is increasing exponentially. So they were able to help five five times better than themselves that they did last year. But the program, problem increased twenty times, thirty times. They're helping, but the problem seems seems to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And a lot of times, these kinds of people they fall into serious depression because they feel like whatever we do. It's just never ending, man. We try to help in one cause, another comes up. We help with one conflict, another conflict arises. There's one group of people that need help. You barely started helping them. Another group of people is being oppressed, and they need help. And it seems like this endless world of chaos, right? And so, and this for a humanitarian when they work like this, you know what happens? They lose all hope. They lose all hope. They just think of the human being, like we said last week, the lowest of the low. This human being is so hopeless. Humanity is so hopeless. How evil and corrupt they are, right? This is on the one hand. Now the Messenger ﷺ even joined a human rights or human uh, 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 what do you call relief organization called Half al Fudul. This is even before he was a messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the same problem: he's helping those who need help, he's helping the oppressed, he's helping the one chained into slavery, etc., etc. But slavery itself is getting worse. He's helping the oppressed, but oppression is getting worse. He's helping the needy, but the, 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 the number of people in need keeps going up and up and up. It's a frustrating humanitarian problem, it's always been there. So you know when a, a person of high intellect, like the Messenger was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they realize, if I am patching up the holes in this boat, every time I pa patch up one hole, another leak is there. I patch up that one, two other leaks come up. I patch up three, twenty-five come up. How do I fix the boat altogether? I've been helping the hungry, how do I kill hunger itself? Right? I've been, I've been helping the oppressed, how do I destroy oppression itself? How do I get rid of the source problem itself? So on the one hand, there is the larger purpose of your own life. But on the other is the solution for humanity. What is the solution for humanity? What, is a human, what, are, what are human beings missing? Why are we in this rut the way we are? And you know the answer for that is something that philosophers, political scientists, sociologists, intellectuals have grappled with that for many, 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 many centuries. To this day we're grappling with how do we deal with this, right? How do we deal with crime in society? Even to this day the, pro the, the solution that we've come up with for dealing with crime, like you know, the United States, you know, with all pride and res you know, uh, respect is one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced society in the world today. We have infrastructure and all of these things and advanced governance and all of that, right? But at the same time, some of the most heinous, unthinkable kinds of crimes happen here. Right? Some of the most disgusting, inhumane, you would never imagine of a crime like that in older times. Those kinds of weird, strange, just despicable things, they happen here. Why? Why would human beings have all this advancement? Why are they becoming less human? Right? Why are they becoming like that? This is a problem to think, and how do you solve that problem? And the solution in our modern society is a few things. 
why don't we open up, you know, these uh, hotlines, right? These, these help hotlines. And why don't we open up correctional facilities? Right, this is the, and maybe that'll help, but we know that that's not helping. We know that's not really a solution. And the problem's gotten worse over the years. Anyhow, it is, uh, uh, according to, again, some writers of Sirah, it is this problem, there are two thirsts, right? Who is my creator? And how do I solve humanity's problems? Two problems. One ad addressed towards the creator, the other addressed towards humanity. Allah Azza wa Jal solved both problems for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he gave him Qur'an. He solved both problems for them. He gave them a solution for humanity, and he gave them a solution for how to be connected to your masters. SubhanAllah. And this is actually no surprise. You know, in Arabic there's an expression, I'll translate it for you. The truth, a true compliment is the one that comes from the enemy. Right? If, if your friend is complimenting you, it's not a surprise. But if your enemy says something good about you, now there's something real, there's a real weight to that. So if for example a Muslim says something good about the Messenger ﷺ, that is to be expected. We have a, a love bias, we, ex we are passionately in love with our Messenger ﷺ. But when non-Muslims speak highly of the Messenger, even though they don't mostly, but when they do, in and of itself that's a huge merit. Because now the one who doesn't even believe is acknowledging something. And you've heard this many times before M Michael Hart and his most influential people in history, he rates the Messenger ﷺ as number one. But I want to highlight one thing he said. He, you know, he gave a rationale for why he lists him as number one. And I want to quote this for you, just so you understand it in the context of our di discussion. He says, he was supremely successful in both religious and secular fields. He's the only hi figure in human history that was supremely successful in both religious and secular fields. So in the realm of spirituality and being in worship of Allah Azza wa Jal, no one is found to be as successful. At the same time, in the realm of governance, social justice, equality for human beings, establishment of a just society and a social order, there's no other example that combined these two things like the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's an unprecedented example in history for Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyhow, so now uh, we want to move forward and I want to share with you the difference between a philosopher and an intellectual and a messenger. This is an important discussion for us to have nowadays. Okay? It's an important discussion for us to have nowadays. Philosophers are really smart people. Intellectuals are really smart people. But messengers are also really smart people. Philosophers claim to have solutions for humanity. They claim that they have a philosophy, an idea, an ideology that's going to help humanity. For example, democracy or capitalism or whatever. It, maybe these are philosophies presented by a philosopher, be it Karl Marx or be it, you know, uh, Adam, Adam Smith or whoever. They're, they're philosophers, they presented a philosophy. And messengers also bring a solution. But there, but there are some differences, right? The first difference is philosophers say, I came up with this from my own head. I thought of this, I figured this out. This is my idea. But the messenger never, ever, ever says, this is mine. Whatever I am presenting to you is not mine, it is from Allah Azza wa Jalla. I'm not even reading it on to you. Look at the first words of the surah. Iqra, read. Read. read some, when you read something, it's not yours, it's somebody else's. Right? So the messenger, he brings solutions for humanity too. But not solutions of his own, solutions that come from a higher source. Right? That's, that's the first difference. The other thing with the philosopher is there's this arrogance. Right? They, they have the better thing and everybody else is inferior. They, they're, they're really trying to promote themselves. The messengers are the greatest examples of humility. They are humble before Allah Azza wa Jal. And we find this, we're going to study this in this uh, uh, profound surah also inshaAllah ta'ala. So let's read, uh, as a, just to fulfill that, that tradition, the, the, the intellect of the human being, Shah Ismail, Ismail Shaheed rahimahullah gave a beautiful explanation of human intellect, human thought. He divided it into three parts. It's very interesting that he did that. And inshallah, it'll help you understand this topic what, that we're coming to. He said the first intellect is uh, uh, al hawas. He said it's knowledge of the senses, meaning you know, fire is hot, or this table is hard, or it's tough, or the carpet is soft. Touch, seeing, smelling, five senses. Data that goes into you from the five senses. This is the first kind of knowledge. This is what all human beings have. Beyond that is علم العقل, meaning inferred knowledge. In other words, you know when you see a fire, you know it's hot, right? You, you touch it, it's hot, fine. But if you see smoke far away, you don't even see the fire, all you see is smoke, can you still tell there must be a fire? 
You can, right? You can infer. You don't have to actually see. You can make conclusions without even seeing. You can compute. You can calculate without actually having to touch and smell and see. Now an animal may not have that kind of inference, but we do. We are, we are a little more advanced, or uh, profoundly more advanced in our ability to infer. These are two kinds of intellect now, right? By the senses and by inference. You infer knowledge. But then he adds a third, and this is ilm al-qalb, he says. It's the knowledge of the heart. Meaning Allah gave us some knowledge before we even developed our senses. Allah put some knowledge inside of us when we were in the bellies of our mothers. And that knowledge was in the ruh, right? And the resting place according to most ulama of the ruh in our body is the heart itself. So this ruh was blown into us. And it has a certain knowledge too. It has a higher knowledge actually. And you know in different societies, they don't exactly use the terms we use, but they use interesting alternative terminology. They'll say something like intuition, right? They'll say sixth sense, right? They'll, say, they'll use these kinds of terms to talk about a, a kind of knowledge that they can't really put their finger on, but they know it's there. They know it's there, right? And that's really this higher sense of morality and higher sense of awareness that Allah Azza wa put inside the human being. Now that knowledge, that, you know, that, that soul, there are two kinds of that knowledge of the heart. That's knowledge that Allah put inside of us. Sometimes Allah, you know, that's the kind of knowledge you get from istikhara. Your heart feels like you should do it. Your heart feels like you shouldn't do it, etc., etc. It could be a true dream. That's also from Allah Azza wa Jal, ilm al-qalb. This is from ulum al-qalb. That's not something you computed. That's not something you touched and felt. It's something beyond. It's another kind of knowledge, right? A true dream is another kind of knowledge. But then from that, from that knowledge of the heart is also revelation. The Qur'an is also that kind of knowledge. And that came on the heart of the Messenger wasallam. The philosophers don't have that. You know what they have? They have knowledge of the intellect. But they don't have knowledge of the heart. So when Allah talked about the revelation of Qur'an, He said, عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ We sent it upon your heart, so you may be from those who have iman. So this Qur'an is something special. It's, it's a higher brand of knowledge. And it combines both. It combines inferred knowledge and it combines spiritual knowledge. Knowledge that could not be inferred. We could not have known about the angels. We could not have known about the Day of Judgment the way we know about it through the revelation. Now let's begin inshallah ta'ala with uh, a little bit of a discussion on the wording of the surah from the beginning. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خلق. This is one of the few surahs of the Qur'an that begin with a commandment. You know the narration, the Messenger والسلام, is by himself in the cave of Hira. He sees this incredible light and it's Jibreel alayhi salam. He grabs him and he feels like he's going to be crushed. And he's commanded, Iqra. And he responds, Ma ana biqari. I can't read. I don't know how to read. I am not one to read at all. Then he releases him, grabs him again, and says, Iqra. And again he responds, I'm not, I'm not capable of reading. And then the third time, and there are two narrations of this. One of them is, he said, you know, uh, the Messenger, uh, or Jibreel Hassan recited the first few ayat. In another narration, the Messenger says, Famada akra. What should I read? What sh- so he finally, you know, he gave in. He caved in and said, what should I read? And then the messenger, uh, and the messenger Jibreel alayhi salam recited these ayat, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ أَلَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Profound first revelation of Qur'an. And th- when this revelation was given, as I told you already, the messenger was horrified, he was terrified, and he in another narration says, uh, it was as though it was written on my heart. I felt as though the revelation that was given was written on my heart. So anyway, he rushes back. He asks that, that a blanket be put over him. He fears for his life. And all of this, you know, th- this uh, the narration goes forward. But now let's look at the language itself. What did Allah choose to say to His Messenger? What were the first words chosen? To be th- this Qur'an that we have in our possession, how was it introduced to human beings? This is the introduction of Qur'an to human beings. Iqra, number one, read. The first commandment in the Qur'an. The first message given to humanity, read. Read. But reading alone, you know reading has always been part of every intellectual civilization, right? But who is this messenger? An nabi al-Ummi, he doesn't even read. This command was not given to a society full of libraries and universities, a society that has a history of books and authors. Nothing. Even the, their literature is poetry. And even their poetry is barely written, it's just memorized. There's not even you go to the library and find Arabic poetry, it's written in the Islamic era. It wasn't even written much before then, subhanAllah. 
And in this society, Allah Azza wa gives the commandment of reading. Not only is the Messenger himself Ummi, the vast majority of people in that society were not read. They were not read. And this is part of the miracle of the Qur'an. In response to that command, the Muslims became the most educated civilization in history. The, the mass education, the way it spread in the Muslim Ummah is unlike any other. We developed the modern university system as it exists. The PhD system in the Western world, if you trace its history, it came from the Ijazah system in Islam. So higher academics and reading and research, as we know it today, is actually rooted in Islamic civilization. SubhanAllah. These people that didn't even read themselves became the world leaders in reading. And this book that Allah gave, not even in the form of a book. You know, Qur'an was not revealed as a book. It was revealed in the form of just words, oral tradition. This orally related book became the mother of more books than any other in history. This one Qur'an, is one book, but it gave birth to entire libraries across continents. So many tafas, every book of fiqh, every book of aqidah, every book of history, every, in Islamic history, every book of tafsir, how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, generation after generation after generation, have written and read and written and read, all coming from what source book? From Qur'an, subhanAllah. It's just one little word, and how it changed the world. How it changed the entire world around. It's a, it's a you know, this, this magnificent concept. Here's another reason why this is so revolutionary. You know the Christian tradition? The, uh, very soon after the corruption of the Christian tradition, one of the ways in which society was kept in check was, average people were not allowed to read the Bible. You're not allowed to read the Bible. Only the Pope, only those who have authority, they can read the Bible. They can interpret the Bible for you. You can't read it. You can't read it. And you know the Protestant movement in Christianity? That was a result of this, this policy. We can read it for ourselves. The Catholic doesn't read the Bible for himself. They don't have Bible study. Protestants do. They have that, right? So at the time of this revelation, the idea of the average person reading revelation themselves is unheard of. You want to connect directly to God yourself? You want to read it yourself? That's unheard of. And why is it that they can disconnected people from the religious texts? Why is that? You see, it's like they made religious knowledge classified information. Right? That's the idea. They took religious knowledge and they made it classified information. What's the benefit of doing that? Now you interpret it the way you want. Since nobody else has that knowledge, they can't question you. They can't say, where did you get this from? What's your evidence? I've read it too, it's not there. They can't do that. So now all the religious authority is in your hand. Anybody who questions you, it's like they're questioning God Himself. You're questioning the Bible, you're questioning the religious text. But nobody can actually go to the religious text themselves because it's been classified. We became from the very beginning a culture, a, a civilization of just reading, openly reading, subhanAllah. We took that middle man away. Every single, you know, in, in modern times they say religion is a means to oppress people, right? Religious societies oppress people in the name of religion. Why did that happen? Because there was always this idea of a clergy. There's a class of people, in the Hindu tradition they have the pundits, in the Christian tradition they had the Pope, and the, and the, 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 you know, the, the, the Vatican had its own hierarchy. In every major religious tradition, even the Fara'ina, you know the Fir'aun? They believe, the belief was, they are descendants of the gods, they have the, the permission to interpret the religion, nobody else can go to their religion. But the idea of there's God, there's the people, and then there's the official authority in between. Right? And this was a means of controlling the people. This clergy, if you will. Right? Islam came, and the only people in between you and Allah are the humble messengers that are asking you to read for yourself. SubhanAllah. It changed that entire structure of corrupt religion. It changed that entire model. SubhanAllah. Anyhow. So, iqra. Bismi Rabbik. It's not just reading, it's reading. Now, this Bismi Rabbik has been interpreted in, the, in a number of ways. Let's go through it one by one. Read. One way it's been understood is maf'ul bihi is za'id. What that means is read the name of your Lord or your Master. Read the name of your Master. So, you know, recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and recite the name of your Master. That's one interpretation. That's probably the weakest one because daba should not be considered uh, uh, mahdoof. Another interpretation is iqra ma yuha ilayka min rabbik. In other words, read what has been revealed to you from your master. So once this command was given, from then, jazakallah khairan, from then until the passing of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was continuously his entire life answering this one command. Allah said, read in the beginning of his career, 
And for those next 23 years, what's he doing? He's reading. He's just responding to that first command that Allah Azza wa had given him of reciting the Qur'an and the revelation that had come to him. The word ba can also be used for support and help and assistance. So it's read with the help of your Lord, read with the support of your Lord, read in the name of your Lord, read in the name of your Master. This is another meaning of Iqra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq. The other thing with be Iqra bismi is when you recite, you let the people know who it's from. So you know in the, in, when you recite the Qur'an and you recite it in Allah's name, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When you say Bismillah and then you recite Qur'an, Every time the messenger would do that, he would let the people know, this is not my word, I am reading it in the name of the one who gave it to me. This isn't my own. So this was a way of saying, when you're rejecting this word, don't think you are rejecting me. They're not, they're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the ayat of Allah. So you, that, that message would become very clear to people, every time he would recite, he would recite in the name of Allah. Not in his own name. These aren't my words. These are the words of Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. So, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Additionally, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, I'm going to quote him directly. Ash-Shinqiti rahimahullah also, also quotes him in his tafsir, Adwa'u al-Bayan. He says, Tu'akkid li hadha al-ish'ar ay laysa min indik wa la min indi Jibreel alladhi yuqri'uk. That every time you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or you recite in the name of your master, it is to, uh, to highlight the fact and to make the fact very very clear that what you are saying isn't from you, nor is it on behalf of Jibreel who gives it to you to read, it's actually from Allah Himself. It's from Allah Himself. Both of, you, both of you are a vehicle by which the word of Allah is being delivered. Even Jibreel alayhi salam, it's not his word. It's just being delivered through him, subhanAllah. Then Allah Azza, this is part of the miracle too. You know, because the, the miracle was supposed to be, and this is very subtle and important to understand, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to us Qur'an. But the Qur'an, if you want to put it simply, has a three-step journey. We have to remember the Qur'an has a three-step journey. The first stage of the Qur'an is in Lawh al It's written as a book. The second stage is it came to the messenger in the form of words. So now it's no longer a book, now it's just speech. So it came from writing into speech. And then the third part, Allah already knew subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it will again take the form of what? A book. Right, so it's three parts. It started as a book, then in the middle, when it was being delivered, it was speech, and then it was again formulated as a book. Right? And now we have it as a book. Now we have it as a book. But when, the, when it was being revealed, it was revealed in the form of what? Not as a book, but as speech. This is important to note. Why? Because there's a fundamental difference between speech and a, a, a written document. A book and a speech are two very different things. The way I speak is not the way I write. They're not the same. They're very, very different. Actually, I've been speaking to you for a good half hour already, or even more, I've been making a lot of grammatical mistakes as I speak, and that's okay, because in speech you do that a lot. But if I was writing an article, I would probably go back and change my sentences and fix it up, and get rid of the repetitions and all of that. I would go through an editorial process. In speech, there is no editorial process. In writing, there's an editorial process. You go and you fix yourself. You correct what you said that's incorrect. You go come up with a first draft, a second draft, a third draft. Every time you see a published book, you'll probably see first edition, second edition, third edition. And if it's the only edition, you'll have acknowledgments. I'd like to thank all the people who helped me edit this book. Right? Because it's, a book by definition goes through this editorial process. But speech doesn't. Now, which, is, which also means practically speech is more prone to mistakes. Because in speech, you have one chance, that's it. Once you said it, you said it. It's out, it's out. You could later say, I made a mistake, but you can't take your words back, they already left. At least with writing, you wrote it, uh, it didn't come out good, you could cross it out, nowadays you could delete it, whatever, right? So the messenger is given this Qur'an in the form of speech. In the form of speech. But Allah from the very beginning even let him know, this isn't actually speech, this is actually a book. Because what's the first word? Iqra, read. You don't read speech, what do you read? A book, right? So even the messenger already knows from the beginning sallallahu alayhi wa and he's supposed to let the people know, yes, I'm giving it to you as speech, but in its origin, what is it? It's a book. It's something, it's, and so how can a speech be like a book? Right? Speech will have mistakes. Now let's see, this is what baffled the Arabs. How is he speaking so perfectly as though it's coming written from a book? And even those who disbelieved, came up with different theories. And one of the theories was, 
he's getting it written down by somebody. <laughs> that was one of the theories. Because it's too perfect to be speech. This was part of the miracle. And how could he have access to a book? If it is a book, how could he have access to the book? Look at the Qur'an raising this question, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَدْلُوا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابُ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ You were not reading any books before this. You didn't even know how to read. وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ You didn't write it with your own hand. Why not? You don't know how to write. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could that be? Then he says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ He sent among the unlettered, the people who don't read, he sent among them, Ummi comes from Umm, you know mother? So you are as illiterate or as unable to write as you were when you came out of your mother. That's the idea behind the word Ummi. Right? You're just as you know, un unaware of writing or, or reading as you were when you came out of your mother. So among these you know, unlettered people, he sent a messenger from among them, meaning he was Ummi also. Which is why Quran says, An-Nabi al-Ummi. An-Nabi maktuban indahum. The, the unlettered prophet who's, who, who they find written about among themselves. So, وَالَّذِي يُظْهِرُوا وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَعْلَمْ أَنَّ قَوْلْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكْ أَيْ أَنَّ مَا تَقْرَأُهُ هُوَ مِنْ رَبِّكْ This is the first, Ibn, Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah says this, he says, what you are reading, every time you say بِاسْمِ رَبِّكْ, you should be aware that this is actually from your master. وَتُبَلِّغُهُ لِلنَّاسِ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكْ That you deliver it to the people in the name of your Lord. Meaning, you never, you never think you're doing this because you should, or you want to, it's always for the sake of Allah that you are delivering this word. وَأَنْتَ مُبَلِّغٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكْ عَلَىٰ حَدِّ قَوْلِهِ And you are the means of delivering it as far as your Lord is concerned, as His word himself says, itself says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He doesn't speak on his own empty desire, on behalf of his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ It is nothing but revelation that has been inspired to him. Now, in this, uh, one more interesting, interesting issue, Allah Azza wa Jal says, اِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكْ الَّذِي خَلَقْ So it is not just read in the name of your Lord or your Master, but there's something more. The one who created. الرب, الربك الذي خلق. Your Master who created. What's the relationship between the Master and creating? As we read, وَصَفَ الرَّبِّ الَّذِي خَلَقْ مَعَ إِطْلَاقِ الْوَصْفِ وَذَلِكَ لِأَنَّ صِفَةَ الْخَلْقِ هِيَ أَقْرَبُ الصِّفَاتِ إِلَى مَعْنِ الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ This is Ruh uh, Al-Ma'ani. Imam Al-Alusi rahimahullah wrote this. And he says, Allah attributed his rububiya, his mastery, his lordship, with his act of creating, because of his acts, this is the one that establishes his lordship more than any, anything else. I made it, I have full rights over it. I made this. When you carve out, old times, you carve out a knife, it's mine, I made this. I have full rights, if I break it, it's my problem. If I fix it, it's my problem. You wrote an essay, it's your, it's your creation. You edit it, you erase it, you add to it, you take away from it, that's yours, it's entirely yours. You have full rights over what you made. You know, nowadays in modern terms we say copyright, manufacturer's rights, right? So the fact that Allah says, read in the name of your master who created, the word created illustrating that he has full rights over you. And you should comply and read because he, he, no one has more rights over you than he because he's the one who created you. So there's a, there's a reciprocal relationship between rububiya and al-khalq. Similarly, this occurs in different places in the Qur'an. Like Allah says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ And you know, in another in more interesting place in Zukhruf, he says, ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That is Allah, your Rabb, the creator of everything. Rabb creator, Rabb creator. Who is the Lord of everything? Allah Azza wa Jal. Who created everything? Allah Azza wa Jal. So this idea of Allah being the master and the creator are combined in this ayah. The idea behind it is very, it's very powerful. When the messenger is to deliver the message, people will call him insane. And the bullies will think he's powerless. He has no power. What are you going to tell me? You're going to tell me I should leave my religion? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You're an orphan, right? The idea that you know, when you have power in society, you can take a podium and speak. The messenger وسلم, has virtually no political power at all. He's just an honest businessman. That's all. That's it. There's nothing more associated with him. Yes, he comes from a powerful family, but his own uncles are the biggest bullies against him. Right? They're, they're some of the worst enemies are his own family. So if your own family is against you, how are you going to get support anywhere else? Now in this sort of a situation, Allah gave him this powerful word, when you speak to people, speak in my name, not your own. The power, the power in your words will not come from your mouth, it will come from Allah Azza wa Jal. And when you 
clash against the ideas of the people, know that Allah is the one who created them too. الَّذِي خَلَقْ مُطْلَقًا He didn't even add an object. The one who created. The question is, what did he create? There's no mention. He just said he created. What that implies is he created everything. There's no limit to what he created. That's when there's no limit to something, you don't even mention it. We do this in the Fatiha. We say, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We seek your help. When you ask somebody's help, you're supposed to specify what do you need help in. If I asked you for help, I said, please help me. You'd be looking at me like, well, what do you want? What do you need help in? You have to specify. But if you need help in everything, there's no end to the list. All you can say is, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We only seek your help. Meaning in everything. So he says he created. He didn't specify what, why? Created everything. The next ayah goes on to specify it. خَلَقَ insan. He created everything and especially he created the human being. مِنَ الْعَامِ إِلَى الْخَاصِ It's going from general to specific. He created the human being. مِنْ alaq. The Arabic word uh, alaq is, is from a ver- verb عَلِقَ and also pronounced alaqa. It means to cling and to hang off. To cling and to hang off. By implication, people have uh, uh, interpreted it to mean a clot of blood. But really, for example, عَلِقَ الصَّيْدُ فِي الْجُعَالَةِ The Arab expression that the, the animal that you were trying to hunt, it got clung or it got caught inside the net. That's why عَلِقَ is used, right? And it's used in the sense that the عَلَقَ, the, the sperm of the male, when it goes inside, the, through the uterus and all of that, and finally it, the, it impregnates the mother, it's actually hanging off. مُعَلَّقَ and this is something that's discussed in modern embryology and at the time couldn't possibly have been known. Not at all. That this, it's not just a clot of blood as most translations say. Alaq literally means that which hangs off. And if you look at you know, sonograms and things like that in modern embryology, the earliest stage of the formation of the baby, the confirmation that actually impregnation has happened is the hanging, you know, mu'allaqa. It's just, it's hanging off. Literally alaq. Subhanallah. So there's been a, a tremendous amount of work done on this particular word alone. There are other places in the Qur'an that talk about embryology, but this particular word is of key interest because it, it alludes to Allah Azza wa Jalla's profound knowledge in the most secret of things. We don't even know what's inside of ourselves the way Allah does. And it's an indication of Allah's ayah. He says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We will show them our miraculous signs in the horizons and even inside themselves. This is a miraculous sign inside of ourselves. حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ until it becomes absolutely clear to them that that in fact is the truth. I want to highlight for you though, whenever Allah mentions the creation of the human being, the purpose is to highlight certain things. So I'm going to share with you three things that is the purpose of highlighting the human being was created from nutfa, salsal, teen. Different words are used in different places in Quran. Okay? Nutfatin amshajin nabtalihi, etc. etc. When this comes up in the Quran, and it comes up a lot, what is the intended lesson behind it? There are at least three lessons. The first lesson is resurrection. The one who created you from a, you know, a piece of fluid can recreate you. How difficult is that for him? If he can do that, if he can create you from a fluid, then he can create you out of the earth once again. It's not a big deal for him. So it's a reminder of Allah's power of resurrection. That's number one. The num- uh, number two thing is, this fluid seems like it's purposeless. And then it evolves into something that seems to have intricate design and it's balanced and ahsani taqweem so in one surah it was fi ahsani taqweem the other min alaq right and alaq seems to be this just piece of wood clingy piece of flesh but then this advanced human being with so many amazing features and, and intellect how can these two things be parallel the idea is you, you went from something that doesn't have much purpose or much function to something that has much higher function and you know when things have more advanced function the idea is they're, they should do higher tasks, right? Something that has low capability can only do less things. Something that has high capability should be able to do higher things, right? So the fact that Allah created you with such amazing intricacy means you were created for a higher purpose. You were created so wonderfully, it must mean that you're able to do higher things. So it alludes to the higher purpose of the human being. Then finally, this uh, is actually a means by which Allah humbles the human being. Allah Azza wa Jal humbles the human being. He created you from a fluid which you yourself consider dirty. Right? So who do you think you are? Oh, you did this credential or that credential or your business is going this well or you have this asset or that asset or people think of you as this, that or the other or you have this political power or that name or that name. 
Who do you think you are? Your origin is this filth. Your origin is something you yourself find disgusting. So know your place. Allah Azza wa humbles the human being by mentioning his origin. And it's interesting that Allah Azza wa mentions this and then says, Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Recite again, read again. We'll talk about why he says that again. But Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. And your master is the most noble. First he tells us how we actually don't own any nobility ourselves. We come from alaqa. We don't owe, we don't deserve any nobility. And if, karam in Arabic is something that should be respected for what it is in and of itself. Original. We don't have anything in and of ourselves, in and of ourselves originally that alaq that should be respected. It is Allah who honors us. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We don't have honor in and of ourselves. We don't have karama. That is Allah, al-akram, the most noble. So first he mentions our humility, and then he mentions his nobility. He compares the two subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then why does he say iqra a second time? You see the message, you know when a student is scared, and the teacher says do it, then he comes again, just do it, again. It's like encouragement. The messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is literally being patted on the back. He's being, you know, encouraged, read again, read, it's okay, read. And read, and your master is most noble, meaning your master doesn't mean to put hardship on you. This is a karama, this is, a, this is an act of nobility from your master that he's making you read. This is a gift from Allah, take it as a gift from Allah Azza wa Then, and, and so he's ennobling you, Allah Azza wa is ennobling you. And the fact that this al-akram is used, inshallah ta'ala, probably we won't get to finish the surah today, but when we do, we'll talk about this, is later on in the surah, you're gonna find the messenger in a situation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he was humiliated. He was humiliated by Abu Jahl. And at that time, it's important for him to remember why is he reading. He is reading because the most noble Lord, the most noble Master made him read. He gave him nobility. No matter how much they insult him, they will never be able to take away the nobility of the Messenger wasallam. He will go through difficult times, but these words will give him strength. اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ The one who taught by means of the pen. And this has been interpreted in a number of ways. Firstly, the hadith uh, in which the Messenger says, "Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, أَوَّلُ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْقَلَمْ فَقَالَ لَهُ أُكْتُبْ The first thing that Allah created was the pen, then He said to it, write. Meaning everything that has been, that has been created is a manifestation of Allah's word that has been written. That's one implication of the word qalam. The other is in the, in the sense of dunya. All knowledge that we have today is a result of something somebody wrote before us. And how did they get their knowledge? They read something that somebody wrote, before them, and then somebody who wrote it before them. Oral knowledge dies out, but written knowledge passes on, it passes on, it passes on, it passes on. So Allah will, Allah taught by means of the pen. Now look, two times iqra. Iqra in the beginning, iqra now. Then allama, allama al-insana bil qalam. Then allama again, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. Two times read, two times he taught. So the whole theme in the beginning is learning and teaching and learning and teaching. So that's the ultimate theme. And then on top of that, reading compared with the pen. So there's two activities in education, right? Reading and writing. Both of them are covered. Iqra and then qalam. Both, both dimensions of learning are covered. And so one is when you benefit from the knowledge yourself. That is iqra. When you read it for yourself. The other is when you bene- want to benefit others. Then you write. Because what you write doesn't just benefit you, it benefits others, right? And this pen is so ennobled. Allah Azza wa made it a means by which knowledge is delivered. And it's so powerful that Allah even swore by it. Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Noon, and I swear by the pen and what they write. The pen and what they write. Then this qalam is also the means by which Allah actually preserved His revelation. So kiraman katibin ya'lamuna ma tafalun. On our sides there are angels that are writing. Kiraman barara, the, the angels that are in the company of the revelation. They are writing Kitab al-Abrar, Kitab al-Fujjar. They are also written Kitab al-Marqum, Yashaduhu al-Muqarrabun. Right? So this idea of the pen being you know, incredibly powerful as a means of preserving, as a means of delivering knowledge is something that is in the, in the Alim al-Ghayb. It's in the unseen and also in this world. Subhanallah. Just about knowledge itself, just, you know, a couple of a hadith before we go on. Uh, uh, one hadith, beautiful. مَنْ سَلَكَ تَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمٌ سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ SubhanAllah He says, uh, whoever takes up a path in which he's trying to acquire knowledge, Allah will facilitate for him a road to Jannah. So he's taking a road to knowledge and Allah is making for him easy the road to Jannah. May Allah make us from those people. 
Secondly, of course this hadith comes over and over again, but now you understand the spirit of it. خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you are the ones who learn Qur'an and teach it. Learn Qur'an and teach it. Learning the Qur'an is a sunnah of the Prophet He's the first one who learned Qur'an. So when you're learning Qur'an, you are doing what the Messenger himself did wasallam. Teaching the Qur'an is not only a sunnah of the Prophet, it is the sunnah of Allah Himself. عَلَّمَ Quran. Allah, He taught the Qur'an, right? So imagine the power of learning and then also teaching the Qur'an. And then you'll appreciate the beauty of these words, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ What more noble task can there be? That you're mimicking the activity, not just of the Messenger, but an act, an act of mercy given by Allah Himself. الرَّحْمَانُ عَلَّمَ Quran. He is the one who taught, the exceedingly merciful, is the one who taught the Qur'an. Now, so the, the, by saying, some have actually deduced this, and this is uh, probably the last comment on this ayah, some have deduced by the use of the word qalam in this ayah, that Allah Azza wa already indu- alluded to the fact that yes, He taught the human being the Qur'an, but the Qur'an will also be committed to the pen. It will also be documented. It won't just remain in speech, it will come back in the form of, uh, written, in written form also, subhanAllah. Uh, so, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ And this is there's a similar ayah in another surah, Allah says, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ means he taught the human being what he couldn't have known, what he did not know. Remember the three kinds of knowledge I told you about? Right? There's knowledge of your senses, there's inferred knowledge, and there's knowledge of the heart, the unseen realm. So Allah gave knowledge which you couldn't have had on your own. Knowledge of the senses you can get on your own. Knowledge of inferred knowledge, some logic you can develop yourself. But this knowledge that was revealed on the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you could never have known that knowledge. You could never have had access to that knowledge. So he says he taught the human being what he couldn't possibly have known, and it's referring to revelation number one. And specifically, who was the first student of this revelation? Yes, all of us today are all Muslims are students of revelation. But who's the first student of this Quran? It's Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. First, he's the student, then he's the teacher. So in another ayah, Allah says, you're the first student. So He says, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ He taught you what you yourself couldn't have known. So He puts the Messenger Himself in the position of being Allah's student, subhanAllah. And this again, the idea of ilm, qalam, iqra. These are the last things associated with a man who doesn't read and write. This is part of the miracle of the passage. That Allah enlightened these people. And they became so enlightened, this ummah became so enlightened, that Europe lost, you know, over, t- over centuries, Europe lost its intellectual civilization. They went into what is historically called the Dark Ages. And in their Dark Ages, you know what they had to do? They had to travel to the Muslim world, and they had to, tra- uh, you know, all their books of philosophy and, and uh, writers, their writers, uh, the writers of the Christian world of Europe, their books had been burnt in Europe by the Christians. But the Muslims had translated them, and they were actually in the Muslim world. So Europeans to learn their own history had to go to the Muslim world and read about their own works in Arabic and translate them back. We became the people of the pen. We became where you come, we became the intellectual capital of the world. But on the one hand that's so amazing, on the other it's also pretty sad. Because today, you combine all the universities in the Muslim world and there are less universities there than in the state of California. Okay. We have less universities in the Muslim world than, there's not even a fraction. There's, you know, a small country like France has more universities than all of our universities combined. And even what we have doesn't even compare in any way. Like the quality of education, the infrastructure, there's no comparison. Where we were, where Allah put us, where we are now, subhanAllah. And so it's, not, you know, it's easy to gloat, look in the past and say, oh, we were awesome man, we were so cool. And just live, live it up, right? And it's, it's kind of, it's easy to forget the hideous present in which we are. We have to do something about this. This is the, the legacy of our ummah. If we don't do something about this, I can guarantee you our children won't. And if they don't, forget it for the next two generations from now. We have to think generations ahead. We can't just think. You know, in this society, they teach you how to think about yourself. Make your five-year financial plan, ten-year plan. What are your career goals? Muslims don't think like this. Muslims think generations ahead. That's how we're supposed to think. We, in the Muslim civilization, you'll have an old man, he's like 85 years old, he's about to die. He's about to die, he's still planting a seed in the ground for a tree. Right? And you have, you're never going to see that tree. Why are you planting? Someday somebody will benefit. He's thinking of the future. Compare that to the society in which we live, it's, it's a problem of the kuffar, of the non-Muslims, 
and it's also our own problem. These people live it up man, just take on credit card debt, do this, that, the other. Some of the most, you know, the richest people in this society, the, you know, the um, Donald Trumps of this society, take this on a mortgage, take that on a mortgage, take that on a mortgage, make the minimum payments, become a trillionaire, billionaire, whatever, right? But make the minimal payments. He owes so much money, you know, be, be, he's one of the richest people in the country, but if he paid out all of his debts right now, he'd be in z minus millions, millions upon millions. But what's the philosophy? The philosophy is pay the minimal, live it up. How long am I going to live? I'm going to live another 40 years, 50 years, whatever, then I'll die. Then whatever I owed is not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. That's the idea. The idea is instead of leaving the future generation with something better, the idea is leave them with your problems. That's the idea. The entire healthcare debate in this country, the entire national deficit debate in this country, somebody before figured, somebody will later will deal with it. We don't have to deal with it. Right? That's the philosophy, that's the mentality. Compare that to the mind of the Muslim. Allah Azza wa gave us how to think forward and the, the first way forward is education. عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ What he could not have known. He taught the human being what he could not have known. So these first five ayat are considered the, the first revelation given to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The other narrations of the first revelations are Surah Al-Muddathir, Surah Al-Muddathir, Surah Al-Fatiha. But they, they, it can be reconciled. Surah Al-Muddathir is the first revelation after the Fatra. Meaning, you know, when this revelation came, there was a long period in which there was no revelation. And then Surah Al-Muddathir came. So it's the first revelation after the gap. That's how that's the first revelation. Fatiha is the first revelation correctly because it's the first complete surah. Surah Al-Muddathir was just the first few ayat. Here also the revelation wasn't the whole surah, it was the first few ayat. But Fatiha when it was revealed, it was all seven ayat all together as one surah. So the first complete surah revealed, yes it is the Fatiha. So that's how you reconcile all these different narrations of what the, uh, the first revelation was. As we go further, how much time, what time is uh, Isha by the way nowadays? So we got a little bit of time, inshallah. Okay. So, kalla inna al-insana layatra. Now we're moving to the second passage. This surah has three passages. The first passage is over. Now we're moving to the second passage of three. And in this passage, it's something tied to the previous surah. In the previous surah, Allah said the human being is the lowest of the low. And I gave you the observation a person can make about the human being. That they are morally just completely bankrupt. People are just corrupt. That's why they do the kinds of horrible things they do. On the inside, they have no goodness in them. We talked about the, the, the evaluation of human psyche by Freud, right? And what, what, kinds of, uh, philosoph what kind of philosophy he presented for the human being. But now we're going to see on the practical side, an observation by Allah Himself. No, not at all. Kalla. Kalla means haqqan. For sure. That's one meaning of kalla. For sure. Another meaning of kalla is... Uh, is Allah, you had better know that this is a, uh, you had better know, you had better realize. Another meaning of kalla, رَوْعٌ لِمَنْ كَفَرَ بِنِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ بِتُغْيَانِهِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَذْكُرْ لِدَلَالِهِ الْكَلَامِ عَلَيْهِ رَوْعٌ means, it's a means of yelling at someone because they were ungrateful to the favor of Allah. What is the favor of Allah in the previous ayat? Revelation and knowledge. So the one who refused this knowledge, Allah is yelling at him by saying kalla. And then he's making a general observation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى No doubt the human being for sure continues to rebel. The word tughyan in Arabic is an interesting word. It doesn't just mean to rebel. It means that you, you know what your limits are, and you make it a point to cross those limits. It's also used for water, tughyan al ma. You know when there's a crazy flood? You know there's one thing the water spilled over. But the water just completely came out of the pot. That's tughyan al-ma. Inna lamma taha al-ma'u hamalnahum fil jariyah. So that's the very strong language about excessive, you know, unheard of kinds of rebellion. Insane amount of rebellion. And that's the word Allah uses for the human being. On the one hand, Allah taught him what he couldn't have known. On the one hand, Allah taught the human being with the pen. And Allah is most gracious. He created him in the best possible fashion. But the reality of the human being, despite all of those honors that Allah gave him, he rebels. He rebels. He has no sense of authority over him. You know, this word is contrast with the word Rabb. Rabb is already an authority over you. But a Taghi, a Taghi, someone who doesn't accept any authority, anarchy. He doesn't want any authority over him. Inna al-insana la yatgha. This is the attitude of the human being in regards to uh, revelation. Now, this 
ayah is actually a really good insight about a few things I want to share with you. Number one, it's an insight into why people actually don't accept Islam. Why don't they not accept Islam? On the surface, they will tell you, I don't know if the Qur'an was actually compiled or not properly. Or they'll tell you, what about this hadith or that ayah or this and that. They'll give you kind of what seems like intellectual reasons. That's why they're not accepting Islam. And even Muslims sometimes, they're not following Islam. When you tell them why, they'll give you all kinds of intellectual reasons. right? But the reality is, Allah has read them on the inside. The reality is, they really love to rebel. They don't want to stay in any limits. They don't want anybody putting any limits on them. Not even Allah. They want to live free. And so Allah says, Kalla inna insana layatra. And you know the the ultimate result of ignorance is rebellion. Ignorance leads to rebellion. The the previous ayat were about fighting ignorance. Read. Read. Among just let, let's not even talk about non Muslims. Among Muslims, who are the most rebellious Muslims? Who are the most rebellious Muslims? The ones who don't read. The ones who don't study the religion. The ones who don't know and don't care to know. They don't know and they don't care to know. They're gonna, obviously they're going to rebel. Right? And they, you have, so that's the internal problem of rebellion. That's not going to be fixed by any discussion. They have to change that inside of them. Right? So, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى Then Allah tells us, what made him that way? What made a human being such a rebel? That was the first insight, right? That the human being, the real re- reason for rejection is this arrogant rebellion. But where did this rebellion come from? أَرَّآهُ stagna, Which is really originally, لِأَرَّآهُ stagna. This idea, you know, to understand it, the, the raw meaning is that he assumes that he's free of need. The human being sees himself as free of need. That's the raw meaning. So he rebels because he thinks he doesn't need anyone. He sees himself in not need of anyone, in, in no need of anyone. What does that mean in simple terms? Allah says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah gave the human being, inspired him with the recognition of what is evil and what is good. How, what's, what's wrong and what's right. When a, when a person does something bad, they deep down inside know it's bad. They already know it's bad, right? But why does someone do something bad? And not, let's not even talk about religious bad, legal bad, legal good and bad, right? Why do you stop at the red light? Because you think you're going to get a ticket if you cross it. There's going to be consequences. Why, do you th- why would you pay your taxes? Because you think the IRS will come after you if you don't pay your taxes. The idea is, you, you're not free of need. People have some control over you, you're not completely independent. If you were totally independent, you wouldn't care about anybody but yourself. And you wouldn't follow any rules. That's the assumption. For, the, for, the lower, for good human beings will still be good. But most people will, go and will have complete chaos if there's no control over them. If they think they're free of need. The fact that you, you know, don't spend on certain useless things, is because you don't have enough money. What if you had an endless supply of money? Would you start spending on useless things? I, I could use that too, use this too, use this too. Because you wouldn't care anymore. You'd become carefree. So Allah says the real cause, the root cause of rebellion, the attitude of rebelling continu- consistently, someone sees themselves that they don't need anyone. They're free of need. They're not dependent on Allah. Does he see himself free of need? He assumes about himself that he doesn't need anyone else. This came up previously in the same surah, in, in, in the same juz. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَا وَاسْتَغْنَا وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَا فَسَنُ يَسِّرْهُ لِلْعُسْرَى Same thing, he was cheap, and then he was stagna, he felt like he's free of need. The uh, a very beautiful comment made here by Al-Sha'rawi rahimahullah, it's very interesting. He says, in this world there are two kinds of laws, physical and moral laws. Physical laws and moral laws. Physical laws, of gravi- gravity is going to pull you down. That's a physical law. Fire is going to burn. That's a physical law. Physical laws, you don't try to rebel against them because they're always operational. <laughs> but moral laws are inside your heart. And when you rebel against them, like if you lie, there's no lightning that strikes on your tongue. And when you steal, your hand doesn't fall off. Right? And when you, oppre- when you, when you strike, you, know, you don't become impaired. The punishment doesn't come right away. So physical laws people respect, but moral laws people take advantage of. This is what people take advantage of. And it's breaking these moral laws and you don't see any punishment coming, you figure, I'm free. There, there are no consequences for doing what I'm doing. When you break or you try to break physical laws, you pay the price right away. Right? You're, you're, the highway says there's a sharp turn coming, slow down, you don't want to slow down, you'll pay the price. Because you tried to break a physical law. 
But when it comes to moral law, you figure, I've got all the rain in the world. There's not going to be any consequences. Well, the one who created the physical laws also created the moral laws. And the one who's giving you punishment for breaking the physical laws right away is also the one who can delay giving you punishment for breaking the moral laws. It's the same source. All the restrictions on the human being, be they physical or moral, come from Allah Azza wa Jal. They come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just an example of that, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا Those who eat the wealth of the orphan wrongfully, they're, they're filling their stomachs with fire. They're eating and they're filling their stomachs with fire. Well, when you eat the wealth of an orphan, try it, it's not gonna burn. It's not gonna burn. Not yet, right? That you're breaking that moral law, but you'll pay for it later on. Not now. So because of that, later on, the human being figures, it's all good. I'm free to go. And so what's the remedy of that? What's the remedy of a criminal society who becomes morally criminal? In this society, we, most of us, we abide by the law, the speed limit, tax, whatever. Basic laws, right? But moral laws, when will people actually become moral? When will heinous kinds of crimes stop? How do you pe- keep a society from becoming excessively shameless and lewd and vulgar? How do you stop those kinds of laws or those kinds of violations? How do you stop them? The solution is in the next ayah. Inna ila rabbika ruj'a. No doubt, it is only to your master that the ultimate return will take place. Until you believe there's an akhirah, until you believe you will pay for everything you did, even the one, things you think you got away with, until you're convinced of that, you will not change morally. You will not change morally. You know, there are two kinds of people. There are people, the average people, they need to have laws, they need rules to follow. Otherwise, they will go crazy. Then there are higher, like, you know, more uh, people with higher sensibilities. People that are at a higher level of morality. Those are the kinds of people, they're not, they don't do good because they're, they want to go to Jannah or they're afraid of hellfire. They do good because they want to please Allah. That's a higher goal. But most people aren't at that level. Don't think, don't assume about yourself that you're at this high level. Assume about yourself, you need to get away from hellfire. This is, you know, Understand that about yourself. That we are at a certain level where we need to think of the consequences first. If you mature yourself in your good deeds, then eventually yes, you will do things for the pleasure of Allah. But in the beginning, it's really not because you're seeking you know, the pleasure of Allah, you don't care about anything else. It's because if you do bad, there will be consequences. So, inna ila rabbika ruja'a covers all of that. The one who doesn't want to disappoint Allah Azza wa Jalla, he'll be returned to Allah. He doesn't want to stand before Allah having done humiliating things. A simple example before we go on, if you do something terrible and your mother finds out, right? you, you did something humiliating and it was caught on tape and your mother is watching the video, how embarrassed would you be? Right? You would, you would stop doing whatever it was because it was so humiliating, even though you're really tempted to do it because it was so embarrassing that a loved one saw it. When someone develops a love for Allah Azza wa Jal, then they realize what, this humiliating thing I'm doing, Allah is watching. Right? And they develop this sense of shame. How can I do this when Allah is watching? Same way you wouldn't do certain things when your parents are watching. You wouldn't do something, so certain things when your husband's watching, or when your, you know, your, your, your brother's watching, your sister's watching, when people are watching. You wouldn't do certain things. You'd become conscious. You'd develop that kind, kind of consciousness about Allah. But before that, a consciousness of the hereafter. Yes, to your master is the return, which also implies punishment and reward. SubhanAllah. Now we come to the ayat about Abu Jahl specifically. And in these ayat, they're amazing, amazing ayat. I want to give you a couple of, the gist of a couple of narrations, then we'll get into the ayat themselves. Abu Jahl is different from three, two other kuffar in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that are highlighted in the Qur'an. Three celebrity enemies of the Prophet ﷺ are highlighted in the Qur'an. Who are these three? There's Abu Lahab, there's Walid ibn Mughira, and then there's Abu Jahl. These three people are highlighted over others. You could think of them as the three big main enemies. Okay? Of these three, there's some differences between them. Abu Jahl would probably have to be considered the most noble of these enemies. Even though he's a wretched, wicked enemy of Islam. Of these three, he would be probably, by Arab standards, the most noble. Abu Lahab was known to be a coward. Even at the Battle of Badr, he didn't go himself. He hired a couple of soldiers to go fight on his behalf. <laughs> Abu Jahl went himself and fought, and got killed, right? And even when he was getting killed, he was like a man about it. He was like, yeah, cut my neck down here, 
So when they see my severed head, it's a little higher, so they know there was a tribal leader who got killed. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was like, he's a lot of chivalry in him. He was very generous. Abu Lahab was very cheap. He was very cheap. So it's different. Like their personalities are very different. The other thing about Abu Jahl, it's interesting, and in between is kind of Walid bin Mughira. He's not exactly a noble guy, he's more of a strategist. And he's not the enemy of Rasulullah first. He's thinking, man, let's just make reconciliation. What he has to say is pretty impressive, but let's just make him compromise. Walid bin Mughira, his, his discourse occurs in Surah Al-Qalam, and also in Surah Al-Muddathir. ثُمَّ نَظَرْ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَصَرْ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرْ Abu Lahab, there's a whole surah dedicated to him. تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ Right? Now we're getting to the discourse on Abu Jahl. The reason I highlighted him, Abu Jahl, is a certain kind of personality I want to share with you. You know the famous dua of the Prophet wasallam, where he asked for one of the two Umars, Umar and Amr, Umar bin al-Khattab and Amr bin al-Hisham, which is this Abu Jahl. Which means the Messenger wasallam saw something in Abu Jahl that was worth saving. There was something about this guy. If he had accepted Islam, he would have been an amazing asset of Islam. And the hadith, the wording of the hadith is such, it indicates if he had accepted Islam, he could have been another Umar. You know what Umar is in Islam? He could have been that. He had that kind of potential. I, I say all of this to you because I want to remind you of two ayat in the previous surah. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِ We created the human being in the best possible fashion, then we rejected him, reducing him to the lowest of the low. Was Abu Jahl created in the best possible fashion? Was his potential so good that even the Prophet made dua that he might become Muslim potentially? Did he have the potential? Yes. But did he live up to that potential or did he reduce himself to the lowest of the low? He reduced himself. He reduced himself. So one Umar accepted Islam, the other Umar did not accept Islam. Right? And so the, the general concept was given in Surah Al-Teen, now the practical example is being given. There there was, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا آمَنَ أَبُوْ جَهَلٍ He didn't come to believe. Now, why, what was his problem? He actually even liked the Messenger's message, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know that? He liked it. He liked Qur'an. He was actually addicted to it. In one narration, he and Ahnas ibn Shuraiq and Abu Sufyan, before he had become Muslim, they went to the apartment of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, early seerah. They, they're not together. They went separately and they went sneaking and they put their ears to the apartment of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listening to Qur'an because they were addicted to it. And they're sneaking back home and they're all on different walls, right? So they run into each other. So one of them's like, what are you doing here? He goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> right, so they're kind of caught each other in the act. And they said, well, wallahi, we're never going to come back. They all knew why they were there. Wallahi, we won't come back. Next night, they caught each other again. Next night, they caught each other again. <laughs> then they said, this has to stop. If the youth find out, we'll lose all our credibility. Because during the day, what do they tell the youth? Don't listen to that crazy man. We are your elders, we know better. This word is just magic, don't listen to it. And at night time, they're listening to it. So, Abu Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, he goes to Abu Sufyan. He says, we stopped listening, but whatever you've heard so far, what do you think? He goes, it's the truth. Abu Sufyan says to Abu Jahl, Abu, Abu Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, it's the truth. He goes, go, let's talk, go talk to Abu Jahl. So they go talk to Abu Jahl, what do you think? This is by the way in Sirit ibn Ishaq, this entire narration, I'm giving you the gist of it. So they go to Abu Jahl, what do you think? He goes, of course it's the truth. Abu Jahl says, of course, it's the truth. How come he didn't accept? He gave a reason. He said, look, we're, all, we're Banu Amir, they're Banu Hashim. He was from Banu Amir, and the messenger's from Banu Hashim. He says, whenever they fight, we fight, we fight equal. When they're generous, we're equally generous. When they're good, we're equally good. Now one of their people has these words. We will never get words like this. If we accept him as a messenger, our tribe, Banu Amir, loses forever. We've lost. Every time we compete in everything, we can't compete with these words. So accepting him will mean Banu Amr loses forever. I can't accept that. He was a noble guy. He was a smart guy, smart enough to know this is the truth. He was brave in battle. A lot of good qualities. A lot of Umar bin al-Khattab qualities even. What was the thing that destroyed him? Arrogance. It was arrogance. So I want to compare, just so we understand, this is a very subtle matter. 
What is the difference between Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu before Islam and Abu Jahl? After all, when the Prophet made dua sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made dua for both of them, right? One of them? So he saw kind of equal potential in both of them. So what's different about them? We should understand this. What is it that blessed Umar radiallahu anhu? The difference essentially is between taking pride in your nation, taking pride in your tribe, as opposed to having ego for yourself. Umar bin al-Khattab was very proud of his nation too. He had a lot of asabiyah before Islam. He did. This is before Islam. But Abu Jahl, not only did he have that, what else did he have? Ego. His own ego. His own leadership. Now the thing is, the nationalism and tribalism, Islam can get that out of your system. Islam can remove that from your system. But ego is something you have to work on yourself. Ego is something you have to re- remove yourself. It's a bigger obstacle. He was not able to come o- get over his takabbur, his, his istikbar, his, seek, his seeking of greatness for himself. So Allah Azza wa describes his activities. Now that he rejected the message, even though he knows it's the truth, we find several incidents of how he hurt the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa You should know of a couple at least. He's sitting at the haram with his cronies. This is a bunch of gang that used to hang out with him. They're sitting there, the Messenger ﷺ was commanded to make salah. So he's making salah at the haram. He sees the Rasul ﷺ and he says, Oh, that other place there was a camel slaughtered not too long, early this morning. The skin is still sitting there. Who's gonna go? One of his guys was Uqbah. You know, who's gonna go get that skin? Put it on this guy. Put it on the Rasul ﷺ. Uqbah gets up, I'll do it. He was, the, he was like the, the real thug among them. So he goes, grabs the huge skin of the camel with all the filth on it. He waits for the Messenger ﷺ to go into sajda, throws it on top of him. It's so heavy he can't even get up from sajda sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, uh, we find this narration, uh, uh, Abdullah bin Salam, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu narrates. And he says, I was so scared I couldn't go and say, because they were going to kill me if I went. So the word got out, the word got out. And Aisha, actually Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, came running, six, seven years old. She was a little girl at the time. She came and she removed this filth from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And there were about seven of them. And when the messengers, the, the filth was removed, the, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made dua. Allahumma alayka bil bi Quraysh. Oh Allah, deal with Quraysh. It is on you to deal with Quraysh. And then he named them by name. Deal with him, deal with him, deal with him, deal with him, deal with him. And those were the exact seven people who were executed at Badr. Those were the people who were most brutally executed at Badr. Allah azza wa avenged his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, not right away, but at the occasion of Badr. Anyhow, this is one occasion. Another occasion, he tells Uqba, go when he's standing, when the messenger is standing in Qiyam, take the shawl, this like scarf thing, wrap it around his neck and start choking him. And they tried this on the messenger, Another time, he sees the messenger making salah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Jahl comes up to him and says, if I see you praying like this again, I will step on your neck and crush it. He threatens the messenger that he'll beat him down and crush his neck, step on his neck. He said this in front of all his gang. So he's, you know, he's macho, he's showing off. A few days later, the Messenger ﷺ came and made salah again. And he's sitting there. Now he can't just sit there and take it. Because if he takes it, every, all his gang members are going to say, Ah, oh, what are you, scared? You told him he's gonna cr- you're going to crush his neck, what happened? Right? So he has to go after him. So he gets up, he tries to go towards the Messenger ﷺ to attack him. And then his friends, they see him running back and he's doing this with his hands. He's like pushing something back with his hands. And he's running backwards. And they asked him, what happened? What, what, what are you doing? And he says, as soon as I got close, there was this ditch full of fire and there was this you know, terrifying creature about to grab me and I moved back. I moved back. This is the background I want to share with you before we get into these ayat. أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي yanha? Do you see the one who forbids? And Allah is saying to His Messenger, Did you see the one who forbids? Meaning forbids him from praying. Abdan إِذَا صَلَّى Did you see the one who dares to forbid? A slave, a magnificent slave of Allah. Abd is used in the Qur'an for the Messenger wasallam in every occasion where he has been honored. Every occasion where the Messenger has been honored, the word Abd occurs. سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي أَسْرَى بِعَبْدِهِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَى Abdihi. Abd is an honorable term for the messenger, the slave of Allah Azza wa Jal, the noble slave of Allah. He dares to forbid a slave of Allah, إِذَا صَلَّى When he goes to pray, 
So now previous ayat where he doesn't need it, he doesn't fear any consequence, right? Our, you know, there's kalla inna al-insan layatga arraahu stagna, right? And he doesn't think he's going to return to his master. So now what does he do? There's not going to be any consequence. I can attack this man when he prays. Arraayta ladi yanha abdan ida salla. So we find Allah Lucy says, In the Abdul Musalli who are Rasulullah, when Nahi who are Lain Abu Jahal. That the, the one praying is the Messenger of Allah and the one forbidding is Abu Jahal, the cursed. Araita in Kana ala al Huda. Amazing ayah. Now you will appreciate this ayah. Allah says, Don't you see? And Araa uh, uh, is different from Basara in other words in Arabic. You know how you say, when you, when you understand a very difficult problem, you say, I see. Which in the meaning of I understand. You understand? It's not just I see literally, but I also understand. Or I see where this is going. Right? I see where the community is headed. That doesn't mean you physically see, but you can perceive the consequences, right? Allah Azza wa says, Ara'ayta in kana ala al-huda. Did you see? If he had been committed to guidance. He's telling the messenger, did you see? Would you, did you realize if that guy, that Abu Jahl, if he became committed to guidance, how, what an amazing person he would have become? And is this something the Messenger already saw? He already saw it. Because he made the dua, right? He said, give me one of two what? Umar. One of two Umar. So Allah says, don't you see the potential? Didn't you see? Had he been committed to guidance? And then, you know, to be on guidance, who does that help? Yourself. When you're committed to guidance, it helps yourself. Ala al-Huda, to be committed to Ala, upon it. To be committed to it. So to be committed to guidance yourself. But then there's another thing. It's not just you're committed yourself, like Umar bin al-Khattab. First he committed to guidance himself. But then what? He didn't just keep the guidance to himself. He commanded other people to taqwa too. What's the next ayah? Aw amara bit taqwa. And, or he even commanded to taqwa. Not only did he take the guidance on for himself, he became a means by which he is delivering the guidance and taqwa to others. He commanded others to fear Allah. Didn't you see that potential in him? This is actually an elaboration of the Prophet's own supplication in regards to Abu Jahl. And the amazing potential this poor fellow had. This guy, the cursed of the curse, this la'een, as the mufassirun call him, this cursed fella, he had potential like Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Had he only realized that potential. Allah created him fi ahsani taqleem. He, he chose to be asfal asafirin. He chose that. He chose that for himself. So, araita in kana ala huda, aw amara bit taqwa, araita in kadhaba wa tawalla. Did you then see if he, cho- if he chose to lie against, tr- lie against you and lie against the truth and turn back, turn away? In other words, you know, if, if he had turned good, did, can't you see the good that would have come with it? But if he has turned bad, do you see the harm that will come of it? Don't you see the destruction he will bring upon himself? The messenger is being depicted with the words araita to show us that the messenger has amazing foresight. He can see the benefit and the harm of things. He can analyze things in a deep way to see their long-term consequences. And we're being taught to think like that. We're being taught to think, do this good thing, can you see what good it will bring in the future? If you don't do this right, if this guy continues the way, can you see the harm he's gonna land himself in? So, araita in kathaba wa tawalla. And then, the, when, he, when he turned away, you remember the, this an amazing contrast, أَرَّعَاهُ stagna. Does he see himself that he doesn't need anyone? On the other hand, on the other hand, Allah says, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى Doesn't he know that Allah saw? That it is Allah who was actually watching? That Allah Himself saw? Sees? Why is this important to mention here? He thinks he is violating the Messenger wasallam. That's what he thinks. But even he believed in Allah. Even most mushrikun had some concept of Allah. This guy is so far gone, he, the, the thought that maybe Allah is watching, that Allah sees what he's doing, that didn't occur to him. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. And this is the attitude of someone when they become such a you know, deviant criminal. You, you know, when a, when a criminal is about to attack an innocent victim, they say, for God's sake. God is what? They call on God. But for a criminal, even that's not much. Right? That, even that, that shahada is not enough. God is watching. That's not enough for them. Right? If there's any ounce of good in them, you call on Allah. Look, Allah is watching. Like you know when uh, Maryam salamun alayha was visited by the angel, she got scared. But maybe this guy has some ounce of good in him. So what does she say? أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّةً I seek refuge of Ar-Rahman from you. She called on Allah. 
So she reminded him of Allah, if you have any taqwa at all, right? But this guy, has, it hasn't even occurred to him that Allah Azza wa Jal sees. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى Because we're out of time, I'm going to uh, stop the dars of the surah here. You know, the rest, the, the, the third part is the third passage of the surah. But here I want to share something very important with you. What is the relationship between knowledge, which was the first passage, and the arrogant kafir, which is the second passage? Isn't that what it is? The first passage was, اِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ All knowledge, knowledge, learning, teaching. قَلَمْ اِقْرَأْ عَلَّمَ All these words. But then we turn all of a sudden to this ignorant, arrogant, rebellious person. And really the source problem as we learned already is rebellion. Is rebellion. What's the connection between two, these two things? The first thing that you have to note about that, inshaAllah ta'ala, is that knowledge in and of itself is supposed to be a means of humility. Knowledge is a means of humility. Shah Waliullah Dahibi rahimahullah said, he gave the example of someone who have, has knowledge. He said, when a tree bears fruit, its branches come down. The idea being, when you have a lot of knowledge, it's like you're bearing fruit. But what happens to your branches? They humble themselves. The more knowledge you have, the more humble you should be. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء who truly fears Allah? Who becomes most humble before Allah? Those who have true knowledge. Those who have real knowledge. So on the one hand, you have knowledge, but it should lead you to humility. The lack of that knowledge, or the rejection of that knowledge, will lead you to what? Naturally then, arrogance. It will lead you to arrogance. And it's amazing. You're humbling yourself before Allah, but Allah is increasing you in, in darajat. But when you try to increase your own status and show arrogance, Allah brings you down. <laughs> It's the contrast, right? You're trying, to come, you're trying to come down before Allah, Allah elevates you Himself. You come up, you try to come up before Allah, show your arrogance, and Allah brings you down. SubhanAllah. That's the contrast we're learning in these ayat. Between ilm and this takabbur, ilm and humility. That, that's the, really the, 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 a profound connection between these two things. And then finally, his ignorance is highlighted in the words, alam ya'lam. In the beginning, alam al-insan. He taught the human being. Twice, he taught the human being. But here, this guy, what's the source of his problem? He doesn't even know. Alam ya'lam. Didn't, doesn't he know? Rhetorically even. He has no ilm. He has no ilm. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. May Allah Azza wa give us a correct understanding of his book and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen. Allahumma ja'alna minhum wa min al-lazina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى we're continuing our study of سورة العلق we started it last week but we left off the last passage and before we finish it off and begin the study of سورة القدر some very basic, uh, an, an overview of the structure of Surah Al-Alaq and its main points, its main discourse and how beautifully it's all organized. So far we started with the first passage in which Allah Azza wa Jal addresses the Messenger Himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the ayat, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ among its many themes, we highlighted the need and the importance that Allah Azza wa gives to seeking knowledge. So the first word itself is iqra, to read. Allama, to teach, comes up twice. Qalam comes up. All these words that have to do with education and learning. That's the central theme of the first passage in which Allah addresses His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of those ayat, the final of those ayat is Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. He taught the human being what he did not know. So Allah taught the human being knowledge that the human being did not have access to. If this is such treasured knowledge that we couldn't have learned it, and the only way we could have learned it is Allah taught us, then what kind of person would it be that would have no value for this knowledge? What kind of person would refuse to learn this kind of knowledge? Allah gives His diagnosis in the next passage, a couple of ayat. These three ayat, basically internally, what is Allah's diagnosis of a person that doesn't appreciate this knowledge? Such, a, such an incredible treasure, who would turn it away? It is no doubt the human being himself that seeks to rebel. 
Meaning this knowledge calls you to submit. It's not just any knowledge, it's not just for your information, it's not casual knowledge, it's something that demands on you submission. And even in the first words, it's not iqra bismillah, it's iqra bismi rabbik. When, when you declare Allah the master, what do you become? A slave. It's calling for action right away. So now, the human being seeks to rebel. rebel. That's one reason to reject this knowledge. Then ar-ra'ahu astaghna, that he sees himself free of need. He doesn't think he needs it. So the human being doesn't think he needs this knowledge that Allah says you couldn't have known it by yourself and the attitude of this person, I don't need it, I can do without it. I haven't learned it so far and I'm doing okay, I don't, I don't see why I should be learning it. You know in, in our times it's easy to understand, why do you go and learn something? Why does somebody go get a bachelor's degree or a certification or they go into certain technology school or whatever? People go learn something because they think it's going to bring them some return, it's valuable. Something that if they, know, if they know it, their life will improve somehow. Or if they know it, they'll be able to help themselves. Well, this person doesn't see the need. He thinks he's okay. Whatever he knows is good enough for him. And he doesn't realize the consequence. He knows, you know, this, no concern that he'll be returned to Allah. So Allah reminds him, Inna ila rabbika ruj'a. No doubt it is to your master that there is the final return. My personal reading, based on whatever tafsir I've read, is every time the third person is used in this surah, Every time the third person is used, it's addressing other than the Messenger wasallam. And when the second person is used, mostly in this surah, it addresses the Messenger himself wasallam. This has been a point of contention as we will see later on in the surah. Where does the third person get directed? He. And where does the second person get directed? You. But in this ayah, inna ila rabbi ruj'a, to your master, this is the second person now, right? This transition of second person is very important in the second passage of the surah. Why? Because this actually is part of a psychological, you know, mind, uh, you know, uh, communication or really manipulation even in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal has these psychological effects that He communicates by means of switching persons. To make that simple to you, let me tell it to you this way. You know, if a teacher walks into a class and knows that one of the students had it, was cheating on the exam, only one. The teacher walks in and he says, someone here cheated on the exam. He thinks he can get away with it. Now he used the word he, right? That's third person. That's third person. That's not second person. But all of a sudden he says, he thinks he can get away with it. He doesn't think that I can catch him. Abdul Karim, can you come over here? He was using he, and all of a sudden what did he use? You. What does that do? It sends shock waves to the criminal. He wasn't expecting it. All of a sudden it turned to him. And you know these criminals, when you talk in third person psychologically what's called is disassociation or diffusion of responsibility. It's not talking about me, it's talking about someone else. So Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about this person, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَطْغَانَ The human being rebels. أَرْرَآهُ اسْتَغْنَى Does he see himself free of need? He, he. إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجْعَى You will be returned only to your master. What do you think, I'm talking about someone else? <laughs> see this change, this shift? So this is the only one in the surah that addresses the human being directly, but the point of it is actually al-ighra, what tahdir, warning, or you know, sending shock waves, and this is done often in the Quran. This sort of switch from the third person to the second to shock the audience. But for the most part, in the rest of the surah, the second person is addressing the messenger himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we said two passages so far. The first passage, the importance of knowledge. The second passage, what kind of person would turn this knowledge away? The third, when you don't accept this knowledge, you're ignorant. And when you're ignorant, what kind of behavior do you engage in? What kind of behavior does an ignorant person engage in? So we read, <laughs> Do you see the one who forbids a slave when he's about to pray? This is talking about Abu Jahl. There's pretty much ijma' on this, on, in the ummah among the mufassirun, that these ayat that are coming, that he forbade him from praying, and then the fact that Rasulullah had made dua for him. So Allah says, had you, have you ever, ever thought, and we talked about this last week, أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى Even before that. So, you know, uh, uh, these ayat that talk about Abu Jahl, they're interestingly placed right after the ayat of knowledge. Because Abu Jahl, if you know what the word Jahl means, it means ignorance. So they're the ayat of knowledge, and then the polar opposite, the father of ignorance. The guy who was named by that. And by the way, the Arabs used to call him Abu Hakam, the father of wisdom. And the, you know, in this father of concept doesn't exist in English, but we have other things. You know how we say, that's, that's a basketball man, right? Or oh, that's a car guy. What does that mean? 
When I see him, I, I know this guy is obsessed with cars, or he knows a lot about cars, or he's great at playing basketball, right? We put a guy at the end of it, right? That's a computer guy, right? Well, they didn't have guy, they had Abu. So, you know, Abu Jahl, we don't, shouldn't really translate it as father of ignorance, that's the ignorance guy. You theme, see him, the first thing that comes to your mind is ignorance. But before this, he was known among his people as the wisdom guy. He was, the, he was the guy you turned to for counsel. He was one of the smart leaders among Quraysh. But what knowledge did he reject? The knowledge Allah talks about in the beginning of Surah Al-Alaq. You reject that knowledge, you can have all the knowledge in the world, you're still what? You're still jahil. You're still ignorant. So those ayat come about Abu Jahl. Now we come to the next part. So there are three passages so far. Knowledge, then the rejection, the, so, the reasons for the rejection of knowledge, and then the behavior that, that occurs because one rejects knowledge, what kind of lowly person they become. And now we come to the fourth, Allah Azza wa Jal declaring warnings against those who reject knowledge. What is the consequence of ignorant behavior? So, you know, this guy thinks there, he doesn't need it. And because he doesn't need this knowledge, when he does something bad, he doesn't know the consequences of it. He doesn't realize it's going to bring him anything bad to himself. You see, he, we talked about how he had animal skin, the skin of a slaughtered camel placed on top, heaped on top of the messenger وسلم, while he was in sujood. He had one of his thugs even try to choke him when he was in salah from behind. He had to be rescued a couple of times وسلم. So these couple of incidents, he doesn't think anything's going to happen. What's going to happen? Who's he got behind him? Who's going to protect him? So now Allah Azza wa Jal responds. And when he responds, he doesn't talk to him. You know, there's one thing to say, if you don't stop, this, this will happen. And, if, and pay attention to the words. I said, if you don't stop, what person is that? That second person. But look at the ayah. Kalla, this is where we're beginning. Kalla la illam yantahi. No, if he himself doesn't come to an end. If he doesn't stop himself. He, not you. There are two benefits of that. Allah distances himself from him. And we learn from these words, Allah is not talking to him. Allah is talking to the Messenger He's talking to the Messenger about him. So the Messenger needs to be told this, why? Because the Messenger is the one who is being attacked. He's the one being attacked. And Allah comes to his defense with his words and says, if this guy doesn't stop, you'll see what's, ha what's going to happen to him. You understand? So Allah comes to his, the, the, the counsel and defense of his Messenger Before we go on, two interesting things. You know, in the first passage of this surah, Allah Azza wa said, "Allam al-insana ma lam yalam." He taught the human being what he didn't know. We'll learn two things here, two things that we couldn't have known. One is from the perspective of the criminal. What does the criminal need to know? A bad person. What do they need to know about Allah? They need to know that Allah is watching. A bad person needs to know that you know, like a criminal. The biggest thing that will stop a criminal from committing the crime is the security camera. Isn't that the case? If somebody's watching, he'll stop. If there's a camera on the red light, he'll stop. If it's a criminal, the first thing that will put him in check is that someone is watching. So in the beginning, Allah said, Allah taught the human being what he couldn't have known. But what is that lesson that a criminal needs to learn? Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Doesn't, didn't he know that Allah watched, Allah sees? Allah is talking to Abu Jahl. Didn't he know that Allah, that's the knowledge he needs to have. Why? Because if he had that knowledge, even the slightest amount of that knowledge, he would not engage in the behavior that he engaged in. So for the one who is engrossed in sins, this is a very powerful lesson in the Qur'an here. The one who's engrossed, I mean, even among the Muslims, the one who's engrossed in sins, what is the knowledge that needs to be told to them over and over until it gets internalized? Allah is watching. Don't you know Allah is watching? Don't you know Allah is watching? You know when you do something bad, when you do something indecent, and you say, did you, did you realize your dad was watching you when you were doing that? Did you realize your boss was actually listening when you were cursing him? You know, when somebody else is watching and you, do this, you behave badly, all of a sudden you put yourself in check. You start apologizing. You realize it was something very bad, right? But now, for a person to gain the first step in iman and leave their criminal behavior, alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Now, that he doesn't even want to accept. That knowledge he even rejects. Now we get to the ayat of consequences. Kalla la in lam yantahi. No, if he doesn't stop at all, then if he still doesn't stop, and la in, this is not just in. In would have been, meant if he didn't stop. La in lam yantahi. If he dares to continue, in other words, lam is here, lam at tawkid, and is also here for al ighra, is warning him. If he thinks he can get away and continue this behavior, if he, gets, if he thinks he's going to continue at all in any capacity, 
لَنَسْفَعَنْ بِالنَّاصِيَةِ We will certainly grab him and drag him by the, you know, in Old English they call it the forelock. It's this hair right in front of your head. We'll grab him by that. لَنَسْفَعَنْ بِالنَّاصِيَةِ We'll grab him by that. You know, now grabbing by this, usually an animal is grabbed from here. An animal is grabbed from the front. When the, when the master is angry at the animal, okay? A, a, a child can be grabbed when the, you know, the adult is being abusive to the child and grab him from the head. In a, in a moment of rage, Musa alayhi salam grabbed Harun alayhi salam where? Here. He has authority over him, he grabbed him on the head and the beard, right? Now Allah azza wa jal in the ayah says, we will grab by the forehead, right here. This here, we'll grab it. This is very powerful. First of all, Allah didn't say, لَنَسْفَعَنْ who? We will, we will certainly grab him. The word him is not there. The word him is not there. It's understood. Why? This is actually part of the rhetoric of the Qur'an. Abu Jahl is not even worth mentioning. It's, one, it's understood. Two, he's not even worth mentioning, especially not with a verb for which the subject is Allah. نَنَسْفَعَمْ We will certainly grab and drag by the forelock, the, the, the front of the head. The other thing is this forehead in Arab tradition and expression was the place of two things. One, it was the place of your pride. This is where your pride is. And actually, this is part of most societies. This is your pride. Which is why, you know, you wear a hat and it, you're, you know, an emblem shows here. In other cultures, you have turbans, right? This is a place of dignity. And also, this is a place, of course, where the mind rests. So this is the place of knowledge. And he had rejected knowledge. That's the beginning of the surah. Will grab him by the part which led him to his kufr. Two things led him to kufr, his ignorance and his arrogance. And what's the place in the body that's the place of ignorance and arrogance? Anasiyah, the cultural representation of it. So that's one, Allah will grab him by that. Then the other thing here is, at the end of the surah we will learn there's an ayah of sajda. And what do you put on the ground when you make sajda? It's right here. So in the end, the messenger is told, don't be like Abu Jahl, you put your head down now in this dunya. But him, if he doesn't put his head down now, when will we drag his head? Eventually. In the end, the head will come down. Either you bring it down in this dunya, or it will be brought down in the next dunya, in the next life, in the akhirah, but it's gonna come down no matter what. You will be brought to your humility. Subhanallah. So, لَنَسْفَعَمْ bin nasiyah. When Nusat لُغَتْ طَيْئِيَةً This is, you know, a tribe of Tayyia, they, uh, the Tayyia tribe. Their, in their language, this word nasiyah was used. قصاص الشعر في مقدم الرأس The lock of hair in the front of the head. This word is also used in other places in the Qur'an. For example, يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيمَاهُمْ فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاسِ The plural, بِالنَّوَاسِ وَالْأَقْدَامِ Criminals will be known and recognized by their foreheads and they will be grabbed by this front lock of hair and by their feet. So this is uh, another place in, in Surah Al-Rahman, Allah Azza wa Jal talks about it. The other thing here is كَلَّا لَإِن لَمْ يَنْتَهِ The first part of it is hypothetical. If he doesn't stop, if he doesn't come to, his activities don't come to an end. But the latter part is for sure. لَا نَسْفَعَمْ We will definitely, لَام for tawqeed, for emphasizing. Then the noon at the end, لَا نَسْفَعَنْ This is noon of tawqeed also, bin nasiyah. So this is very powerful language from Allah. If he dares to, to continue, then certainly there will be very uh, sharp consequences. Now, one last meaning of uh, safa'a. Safa'a in Arabic is to grab something and pull it so hard it starts coming out of its roots. Now think about that. What's being grabbed and how it's being yanked and how his face is being dragged. SubhanAllah. This is huge, huge ayat. And other places in Quran Allah talks about أَفَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ أَهْدَىٰ Is the one whose face is in the ground and he's walking like that. Is he more guided or the one who stands straight up? And some Mufassirun understood that as the scene on the Day of Judgment. People will be being dragged by their faces and some people will be walking upright. May Allah make us from those who walk upright on that day. Now, the, the last thing about this, to tie in what, what we talked about last week. You know, this uh, Abu Jahl, when he, went, when he came and threatened the Messenger وسلم, you make salah here one more time and I'm going to crush your neck. I'm going to put my foot on your neck and crush it. That's basically what he said. Then he saw the messenger make salah again. And all his thugs are with him. So he's going to look bad if he doesn't do something. Right? Because he already called him out the, the time before. So he's not a man if he doesn't go and attack. So he goes to attack the messenger. وسلم, and then he, I told you last week, he's moving back, flapping his arms, pushing something away. Nobody else sees it. 
And he was asked, well, what were you doing? And he said, there was this, this chasm, this ditch, this canyon that showed up before me and him. And there was this vicious creature that was coming at me to grab me. And I was just pushing him back. And then the Messenger وسلم, he told, Bima tuhaddithuni? What, are you going to talk to me like that? Meaning, the Messenger of Allah became strong in his words because Allah had given him this counsel, he's going to be grabbed by his forehead. So the angel was already coming to grab him by the forehead. And he had to run back. Then Allah Azza wa describes in the next ayah, Nasiyatin kathibatin khati'ah. Three words. This is badal from an nasiyah. What kind of, what is it, why mention this forehead? Allah gives it three, two adjectives. This forehead that is kathiba, it's a lying forehead, khati'ah, a forehead that commits a huge mistake. Meaning in his mind, first of all, he, Allah calls him a liar. Which is an insult, number one, it's humiliating a leader of Quraysh. So you have to understand the political, social ramifications of this kind of language. He's already a leader of Quraysh. The, the Rasul Sallallahu is already the subject not only of ridicule, but also of physical persecution. And now the messenger is given words that are basically not apologetic at all, they're calling him out. Calling him a liar to his face. Kathibatin. But what is he a liar about? What the word itself suggests is, he heard the Qur'an, he knew it was true, and he was still lying that it's shi'ir or it's this, and he was rejecting it for untrue reasons. So Allah Azza wa Jal already op- exposed the fact that in, deep down inside, Abu Jahl had already accepted that this is the truth. But he refused to humble himself. And this, from the story I told you last time, Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan that went to go and listen to the messenger recite Qur'an. He testified it's the truth. He said, we're Banu Amr, we're not going to accept him. Yeah, it's the truth, but come on. If we accept him, his tribe wins forever. We can't have that. Our tribe needs to compete. So Allah calls him kathiba. This is forehead, kathiba. Then he says khati'a. And khati'a is a very interesting word. Khati'a is a mistake whose consequences one does not know. A mistake whose consequences, you know, you make a mistake, you don't, somebody says, yeah, I made a mistake, what's the big deal? If you don't know what the big deal is, you don't know what other things are going to happen because of this mistake, this is a khata. This is one of the meanings of, you know, khata. So Allah calls him khati'ah, in other words, he rejected the Messenger Wasallam. He attacked the Messenger Wasallam. Even if he calls it a mistake, he doesn't realize what the consequences are. He doesn't see what the big deal is. And when it gets grabbed, you realize what this mistake was now? So nasiyatin, kathibatin, khati'ah. Now we come back to this life. And Allah Azza wa Jal opens him a challenge. First he said if he doesn't stop, he's gonna get grabbed, right? That was the first part. Now it goes further. Allah basically calls him out, subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلْيَدْعُوا نَادِيَ Let him call his gang. <laughs> Nadia comes from, you know, Nadi in Arabic is a public place. And he used to sit in public places and he has to have, used to have a lot of people hanging out with him. You know, like a popular gangster and all his sub-gangsters that all want to be, they're, they're low lives but they only feel cool when they hang out with the cool guy. So they had those guys with him. فَلْيَدْعُونَ Allah says, let him call his gang. Let him call the people he calls on. Bring them on. Bring your entire posse together. You know, understand, Allah is speaking. But to the kafir, who is speaking? You have to understand this. To a kafir, only the messenger. They, they, all they see is this one man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he speaks, because they are kuffar, they don't think these are Allah's words. Whose words do they think these are? They think they're his words. He's standing in, a, in, in front of a bunch of criminals that are actually pretty violent, and they've seen battle, and they're tough guys, and he's saying, bring them on. فَلْيَدْعُونَ نَادِيَ Bring, let, let, call out his, his people. Now, after this, by the way, Allah Azza wa Jal then says, سَنَدْعُ الزَّبَانِيَةِ Then we will very soon call الزَّبَانِيَةِ which is the plural of Zabniya. Zabniya in Arabic means a security guard, a cop. He's, Allah says, you call out your gang, I'm going to call out the guards. Who are these guards? When some of the Mufassirun like Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah says, مَلَائِكَةُ التَّعْذِيبِ فِي جَهَنَّمَ لِأَنَّهُمْ يَدْفَعُونَ أَهْلَ النَّارِ إِلَيْهَا Because Zabana in Arabic means دَفَعَهُ وَرَمَبِهِ It means Zabana to, to protect something, to guard something, and to guard it with force. And if something tries to get out, you attack it. You, you give it a beating. Okay? So prison guards basically. That's one way it's used in, in classical literature. Qatada radiallahu anhu called it you know, police, security, soldiers, that sort of thing. Now imagine this scene, it's very easy for us to picture now, it is very easy. On the one hand you got gangsters, right, you got a bunch of thugs. On the other hand you got the SWAT team. Is there even a competition? Right? 
you call out your friends, we're going to call out a horde, military, mil the entire military comes out against them. So there's not even a competition. And this calling out, this challenge that was issued to him, and the fact that he ran back, this is how this ayah is interpreted. That Allah Azza wa issued this army against him. Right? When he came to attack his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then at the end, so this, is the, this was the last passage. Once again, let's reiterate what the passages were. The first was knowledge. Then what kind of person would reject knowledge? Then what kind of behavior does the one who reject knowledge engage in, like Abu Jahl? Then what are the consequences of rejecting, or this behavior? What, what's going to happen to him if he rejects this behavior? And finally, finally, you know, most people who, who try to practice their deen or give the da'wah more than anybody else, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you could say that the kuffar and their animosity is a distraction to his work. It's a distraction. And it's demoralizing. He's trying to do the most noble work, and here these people are, not only do they use the nastiest language, but they actually physically attack him also. So it's demoralizing. So at the end, Allah Azza wa Jal basically disregards Abu Jahl and starts talking to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, kalla la tuti'hu. No, no, not at all. And kalla is a means by which something is completely disregarded. You know, uh, no big deal. Kalla. Don't worry about it. Not at all. Leave it. It's, it's not even an issue. This guy is nothing. Basically, Abu Jahl and his animosity is nothing. There's nothing against you. Don't let it get to your head. Don't stress over it. Kalla. La tuti'hu. Now, ita'a in Arabic doesn't just mean to follow, it also means to pay attention, to succumb to something, to comply, to yield into something. La tuti'hu. Not just don't follow him, don't even pay attention to him. Don't even succumb, don't yield to his pressure. Don't worry about it. Don't be intimidated by it at all. Now, if you, when you're not distracted by that, what should you do? Wasjud and make sajda. You see, he refused sajda, right? So his forehead gets dragged. He gets another kind of sajda to do in hellfire. But the messenger is told, don't be like him. You make sajda. Watch, wasjud. Waqtarib, and you come close. He, the messenger is told, come close. You know what's beautiful about these ayat? Allah Azza wa says, wasjud. But he doesn't say, wasjud lillah. Make sajda to Allah. Wasjud lahu. Wasjud li rabbil alameen. No, Allah does not mention himself. Is it obvious that it's about Allah? It is. And this is the second thing Allah teaches us. It's very beautiful in this surah. The surah began, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ He taught the human being what he couldn't have known. One thing the human being, the criminal needed to know was what? Allah is watching. But here's another very important thing the human being could never have known. You know there are people who believe in God. They believe in God. They want to, be, they want to please God. They do. But they don't know what to do. They don't know what makes him happy. They don't know how to serve him. They're sincere, they want to serve him, they want to know what to do to be a good person. You'll meet people like that at work, man, I love God. I really appreciate everything He's done for me. Thank God I have this job, thank God this, thank God that. They talk about God, they do. But they don't know what to do to make Him happy. So when they don't know, what do they do? They come up with their own philosophies. They come up with their own, the Arabs did this too. They were sincere Arabs even before Islam, who wanted to worship Allah, they didn't know how. So you know what they used to do? Some of them used to take all their clothes off and dance around the Kaaba naked and they thought this makes Allah happy. That's what they did. Why, you ask them why they're doing it? We're trying to make Allah happy. You had other people, you know, a lot of the practices of ignorance and shirk, why do people do them? In the assumption that Allah will be what? God will be happy. He'll be happy with this practice of mine. People slaughter animals, put them in front of statues. Why? Because God will be happy. People had no idea. So now Allah Azza wa Jal, not the criminal, to the seeker of Allah, the one who seeks to please Allah, they didn't know what to do, so Allah taught, wasjud, make sajda. Don't pay attention to him, I'm teaching you something you couldn't have known, make sajda to Allah. And it doesn't even have to be mentioned Allah, because he's the teacher himself, so it's clear who should the sajda be to. And by means of sajda, come close, because what do people do with their ignorant practices? They try to come close to Allah. They, thought, they think these things are going to bring them close to Allah. But Allah told them another way to come close to him. Wasjud waqtarib. Subhanallah. The beginning of the surah was a command. Iqra, read. The ending of the surah is also commands. The ending of the surah is wasjud waqtarib. Make sajda come close. There's also commands. So it begins with a commandment of Allah. It ends with a commandment of Allah. You know what else is remarkable? The two, the two ends of the surah, both of them deal with salah. When do you recite Quran? Iqra. Where do you recite Quran? In salah. Where do you make sajda? 
in salah. What is the means by which we are close to Allah? When, are we, when is the slave closest to Allah? In sajda, in salah. So the beginning is worship, the end is worship. The other beautiful thing about this, the, how the surah is tied together is, the first part, the first commandment was to read, which is a commandment to seek knowledge. Right? Reading enhances your knowledge. But the ending, usjud waqtarib, these are commandments of worship. So there are two things, right? There's seeking knowledge and there's worship. And you know, so there's, there's, there's uh, talabul ilm and there's qira'ah, that's on the one hand. Then there's ibadah on the other. But what comes first? First you learn, then you worship. There's this, seek, there's this you know, uh, gradation between knowledge and then action. And this is something in the entire Qur'an. First you learn, then you practice. Then you learn, then you practice, right? So seeking of knowledge, and then practicing that knowledge, iqra in the beginning, usjud waqtarib at the end. Beautifully tied together, the, the, how cohesively the arguments in this surah are presented. But now inshallah ta'ala we go forward and talk about how this surah is connected to the next surah, which is what we have to start today inshallah, Surah Al-Qadr. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر Five simple ayat Five beautiful ayat But this surah al-Qadr How is it connected? What is the relationship between it? And the surah that came before it. This is Surah Al-Alaq that we just finished. First and foremost, Surah Al-Alaq began telling the story of how revelation began. Iqra. That was how revelation began. The angel came, told the messenger to recite. How did it begin? This surah tells us when did it begin. So while the previous surah addressed the question of how, this surah addresses the question of when. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylat al-Qadr. It is no doubt that we sent it down in the night of Al-Qadr. I'm not translating it as a night of, night of power, how it's commonly translated, the night of power. We have to have a little bit of a long discussion about what Qadr means. But for now, the first connection between the two, how did it begin? And this one is, when did it begin? That's the first connection between these two surahs. The second, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the previous, I keep saying it over and over, الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ He taught with the pen. He taught the human being what he couldn't have known. And in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ What will make you know what Laylatul Al-Qadr is? Previous surah said, he taught him what he didn't know. And this surah says, how will you know what Laylatul Al-Qadr is? It's asking the question, meaning you don't have the knowledge, Allah will give a specific knowledge to you, the Messenger Wasallam, that he didn't have before. Another beautiful correlation between the two surahs that Al-Sha'arawi rahimahullah points out, uh, and also Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan Rai, incredible. The last ayat of Surah Al-Alaq, Allah says, Wasjud, Waqtarib, make sajda and come close to Allah. What's the, what's the opportunity in which you can come closest to Allah? What is the night of sajda and coming close to Allah? Laylatul Qadr, the very first thing in the, in the next. Then in the previous surah also, Iqra in the beginning is Quran. Iqra is, recite what? Recite the Quran. And which Qur'an? The one that came down in Laylatul Qadr. That's the next surah. So they're connected in many, many ways. Another thing that's um, mentioned, كما, كما أن السورة العلق تبدأ بقوله اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق وهو يقرأ ما أنزل في ليلة القدر فكأنه إكرام إقرأ إقرأ ما أنزلناه في ليلة القدر فهي مناسبة ظاهرة. That's what I just said. That you know the first part of that surah is saying recite. This one says what to recite, it, meaning the Qur'an itself, that is what you should be reciting. 